get the ball rolling. So obviously we're joined by Neil. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. I wonder if we just start with just a little bit about you and your background and sort of how you got to where you are now. Oh God. Uh, okay, so I uh, I was very lucky, massively privileged because I grew up in London, uh, in the bur- right in the burbs, right at the very end of um, the Central Line and the and, and, and the Met Line and the Piccadilly, and so it was always a possibility to go up to see theatre in the evening. And my folks liked theatre very much. My mum loved ballet, and my dad loved musicals, and so that meant that between them, there was always kind of the treats as a kid were. Um, uh, leaving school, jumping on the underground, uh, having a tea in a park, and uh, then sitting right at the very, 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 very back up top on a couple of blow up cushions in general, you know, seeing, seeing the latest something or other. And that, yeah, it's their fault, basically, is what I would like to say at this moment. I take no responsibility for my career. Uh, they had nothing to do with theatre, but they kind of took me. And so it t- I thought, well, this is far more fun than real life. And then I discovered that maybe you could get a job in it. So, um, yeah, entirely their fault. That's it, really. <laughs> and, um, I mean, early doors, you, you, am I right in thinking that you did quite a lot of um, corporate sort of casual work? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I suppose, uh, worth quickly saying, so got interested at school, started to really not concentrate on schoolwork and think that this was a possibility. Um, so, you know, really brilliantly flunked my A-levels, uh, dragged the school's averages down, was the only kid who didn't go to university, and uh, and then went to Guildhall. And that was two years at Guildhall for a diploma, because it wasn't a degree course in those days, because um, none, none of this was. They only became a degree course because funding stopped, actually. Uh, so the only reason any of those courses are degrees nowadays was uh, because at that stage, um, a two-year diploma course, there, there, there was a... There was a uh, a flip over moment where two year diploma courses were not mandatory funded by your local council. Mm. And so all the drama colleges realized that they had to make them into degree courses in order for anyone to turn up and pay fees. Anyway, that's a little bit of history. Yes. And then always knew I wanted to do lighting, always knew I wanted to do lighting design and then did almost everything else. I did. Um, yeah, I mean, I knew before I went to college, that's what I wanted to do. But I went to college because I had no links, you know, and in that era, pre-internet, you couldn't find people. You know, I wrote 30 letters, left them at stage doors for lighting designers saying, hello, tell me a bit about this. How do I become a... And, you know, after three months, I had three replies. Only three of them replied. But of those three replies, all were really not very helpful in terms of, like, meeting up and having a coffee. And so I still was none the wiser. So that's why I went to college, uh, did everything there to get a wide uh, discipline background, you know, understand what everyone else was doing. So I did way more set building uh, than I did um, uh, lighting or lighting design or electrics work. But that's useful, you know, that, you know, when you put up shelves at home afterwards, you think, oh, OK, <laughs> that was worthwhile. Um, yeah. And then left, couldn't get work as an electrician or a lighting designer, worked for a little bit as an assistant lighting designer, but for someone who was a real asshole, so I stopped doing that and then discovered I didn't have any work, bugger. So I worked as a sound operator for English Shakespeare Company and toured the country. I worked as a set builder during the day and a fly person in the West End at night, um, double double jobbing. Yeah. That was a good, yeah, it was a good six months of, 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 my, of my life, you know, just trying to drag in cash and then yeah, and then uh, and then I got a job at um, the Red Grey Theatre in Farnham, and that was as deputy electrician and resident lighting designer in one of the last reps that existed at that moment. And I thought, this is it. I've made it. I like every other show, and the shows in between are lit by visiting lighting designers. Yeah, this is going to be a great place to learn. And two weeks after arriving, I got dragged into the artistic director's office, and I thought, bugger, what have I done? And he said we've just lost our arts council funding for the second time we're closing in three months time so that was it i basically spent four months at uh, just under four months at, at the redgrave uh, i lit two shows and the one in between was lit by a light designer who i then went off to do some tours for and as production electrician and relighter and da, ba, da, ba, da, you know and then and then it starts to happen but yes in order to fund my theater career on the fringe I would, and in fact, when I was at the Red Grove as well, I would um, do corporate work. I was lucky that one of my friends from college had zero interest in theatre and wanted to do events. And they 
ended up at a, as a, in a very junior position at Imagination. Mm. Uh, at the time was sort of the big event company. And um, delightfully just dragged me in uh, yeah. every now and again to come and do stuff with him. And of course that was hilarious because at the time at the Redgrave, my weekly wage after tax was £134 a week. And on that, I rented a room and I just about kept the 20 year old Renault 5 running uh, that I needed in order to get to and from work. I mean, I don't understand how I managed to do this and pay my tax and da 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 da. Uh, but at the time, you could get 170 pounds a day working as a, as a dog spot electrician on a motor mm -hmm. show or on a corporate gig. Yeah. So I soon figured out that that was quite a good way of, you do a week of that, and then you can you can spend the next three weeks really sponsoring your work in theatre. Yeah. So as ever, it is sort of true, and I think it's probably still true to this day, that um, uh, you cannot survive in theatre unless you have a secondary income. And that might be you've got rich mummy and daddy, or it might be that you have, um, you do what I did, which is your figure out a way of and thank god for the corporate world at that stage which mm. you know well nothing is working at the moment but the corporate world still will hopefully still exist on the other side of this but that's quite a good way of earning a large amount for the same stuff so if you're able to if you're able to survive on 130 pound a week equivalent nowadays um then the corporate world as long as you don't get used to the money is a good way of sponsoring your income i mean i remember my income dropped from my income dropped by a to a quarter, no, more, even less than that, bugger me, it was probably about a fifth, the first year that I purely did lighting design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I gave up all of that sort of work. Yeah. But also important, I, I did a bit of electrics in theatre as well as lighting on the fringe and, I, and I, being an assistant in theatre. And I realised that there came a moment where I couldn't be seen as an, as an electrician in theatre anymore. I could be seen as an assistant and lighting on the fringe, but I couldn't be seen as an electrician in theatre anymore. And that's something that's very bad about this industry. It's really, really snobby. Yeah. Uh, and there is uh, a, there's an idea, fallacy, that because you are practical, you can't therefore be an artist. Mm -hmm. and that's pretty, I think that's probably the class system working right there, isn't it? Uh, I think that's the class system in theatre. Um, so, uh, that's also why I separated my electrician work off into a hidden section where no one from theatre would meet me yeah. and see that I was doing that, but I was still earning the money. That also ended up being a design career as well early on because I ended up designing for that same company. I designed the, one of the zones at the Millennium Dome for them and taking over the other one. So, Brilliant. you know, big, big design stuff uh, for them as well. But it was super useful. They knew I didn't want to do that full time, yeah. but they would use me as their extra member of the lighting design department uh whenever they needed help yeah and it was it was a really wonderful two-way street uh that you know if i called them up and said i've got a week and bloody hell i'm short of cash they would try and find something to put me on yeah they were very kind very kind and supportive and do you remember the point where where it just you know you stopped doing all that and you were solely designed is, is that a point you remember or did it just happen quite yes naturally? i do it was sort of uh it sort of happened in I mean, it was a bit, bit of a bit of a rollover, uh, but the last job I really did was um, in September two thousand and one. I was already doing a lot of theatre work, but I was still doing a bit of bit of design work. In uh, I think my my theatre career sort of started properly started actually doing real stuff in sort of ninety nine, rather than just you know the occasional show on the fringe. Um, yeah. Very very hard to find out who those fringe directors were. You go and see stuff, you'd think this is really impressive, and then you go, well how do I find this random name in a program? You know, there was no internet. I couldn't discover who they were. I couldn't discover who her agent was. I couldn't find them on social media and send them a little text going, oh, I really loved your work. Can I come and do something? By the way, I'm a life designer. That just didn't happen. So you'd sort of, you'd go and see, it It was a deeply disconnected world. And uh, just to any of you who are worrying about the fact that you're losing a year or two years or however long we're in this COVID shit for, there is five years of my career after leaving college that I really can't quite, tell you what it was I was you know I can think about the specific projects but 
it seems pretty random most of that time. It was slow. It was slow to build up connections. It really, really took time. There was, yeah. there was no quick fix like there is now. You know, you just couldn't Google someone and go, hi, get a job. Just, just didn't happen. No. Uh, What's the question? Oh, yes. And so, the, so Rob Halliday remembers this very clearly that I, there was a moment where apparently I pontificated at some, some, dinner or party or whatever it was. Like, that's it, I'm giving up. I, I don't remember this moment, but um, it has to be around 2000. I did one last job for Imagination, which was September 2001. And we were doing a huge conference for UBS Warburg in Barcelona with all the banks, employees from all the way around the world coming in on a jolly in that kind of way that, that those industries can. Yeah. And uh, well, we did day one, which was September the 8th uh yeah and then uh, well yeah eventually we got to september the 11th and that was yeah. that was that they're building they had offices in the north and south tower and everything got cancelled so okay the, the um the sort of quick fix of googling someone or emailing them now i mean that was one of the things i wanted to ask you was the sort of rise of the internet and social media and you know now we have 24-hour access to interviews and articles and and you know with, with people like yourselves which is an incredible resource but um I feel like a lot of those articles don't do what you've just done, which is touch on how many years hard work there is behind it. I mean, do you feel that there is a sense of impatience now amongst people trying to make it in, in light and design? Oh, you're trying to drag me into saying that the millennials are, are a bunch of asses, aren't you? No, I look, it is, everyone's different and everyone deals with what they know and what they do. But yes, it is so much easier for you now to find everyone. It's kind of wonderful, isn't it? You know, yeah. I, if I want to get in contact with someone, I can, unless they are really a Luddite, I can find some handle for them in some social media somewhere uh, or LinkedIn or whatever it may be, but there's a way of getting in contact with them. And um, that's kind of brilliant. And I get a lot of people getting in contact with me. And I remember how horrible it was not getting 30 replies and, and those three replies and those three replies were deeply unhelpful. So I try to uh, reply to everybody, and if there's a chance, uh, give them a, some form of a comment, if it, even if it's only a day, but you know, come and shadow me, come and sit behind me, come and have cans, watch a tech. Because I think, I mean, I do wonder, I think if I'd had a chance, I might have also just fallen in love with this as much as I already had, but I would love to have been able to ask all the questions that made me realize that this is a really terrible career. And this is a really terrible industry. Yeah. It is, it will, and here's the work-life balance thing. This is bringing it around to this week's topic. Um, it screws your life. Yeah. yeah. If you're going to do this, if you're going to do this at any level and try to make it pay in a way that you will be able to retire, and if you don't have a partner who has a proper job, let me encourage you to get a partner who has a proper job, every single one of you. Someone who is loves you enough to support you through your nonsense art. Um, then it's really hard. It's really hard. And if COVID had happened five years ago before Harry Potter for me, uh, I would have been probably filing for personal bankruptcy and moving back in with my parents aged. Well, I'm not gonna tell you how old I am because sod you all, but really way too old to be doing that. So. <laughs> um it's not a good industry uh, yeah. from that point of view it doesn't i was basically before harry potter i was um i had a thousand pounds on credit cards that i was pay managing to pay the interest off each month and my bank account was going from zero to minus two and a half thousand every month in order to uh, so basically i was never really getting above i was never getting into the black I was just about surviving. And if COVID had hit at that moment, and of course COVID has hit at that moment for many people in the industry, I would have been utterly, utterly, pardon my French, everybody listening, fucked. Yeah. So, and that was, let's be really clear about that, that was, uh, Potter came, came, sorry, I'm just thinking about when it came. It came about 24 years into a career. Yeah. So, let that also be a word of warning, because that's the thing I think I would like someone to have said to me beforehand. And that's exactly what I was, rather than dragging millennials, that was exactly what I was getting at, is that like, there is a huge burn time on, on 
things even at um, yeah absolutely i mean back in back in 2001 2002 um i got dumped uh by a civilian um uh she was a graphic designer and she dumped me she was uh, there was she was half uh, half american half german so you can imagine the lack of sense of humor um but uh, she dumped me with the words, you are financially unviable and irresponsible with your choice of career. Ah. And those are worked. burned onto my mind forever, that exact sentence. She does yeah. remember because she did, uh, she did text me and ask me for some tickets for Harry Potter for her two young boys. And uh, I yeah. said, not, not so unviable anymore, am I? Um, yeah. Right. Anyway, I, I t I'm afraid I was I was somewhat petty and and um, took the long the long cold revenge and said I can't get you tickets. Um, <laughs> yes. Anyway, you know, look, revenge is sweet. It, it doesn't matter how it doesn't matter when it comes. You just you just take it. But she was right. Yeah. I was financially unviable, and yes, I can see I was. It, it to her it would have seemed extraordinarily irresponsible what I was doing. She wanted to get married and have children. And I dropped my income, as I told you before, to a fifth of what it was the previous year. Yeah. And said, no, I'm going to be a theatre lighting designer. And so, I mean, what a dick, frankly, as she was right. So, but if we, if, so if we turn that around then, if, if Harry Potter had never come along, what would you, would you have just kept plodding along, balancing that act or like, you know, because it does sound a little bit like, Okay, in that situation, it fixed everything. But what if it hadn't? Would you have just kept going as as was? Yes. What if it had had? What if it, what if it hadn't? One thing that is really clear about this career is just not uh, the rewards are not necessarily merit based. Yeah. Uh, you can be a terrifically good lighting designer and yet miss out on all those opportunities. In mm -hmm. fact, I had to make a very very hard moral ethical decision, ethical decision, when uh, I got offered Harry Potter, because I got offered it 13 months before it happened. So I got offered it probably May 2015. And I'd been booked for an entire season mm -hmm. of Kenneth Branagh, uh, which was happening over a period of 18 months. And it would wipe out uh, one of those shows, which was Romeo and Juliet with Lily James and Richard Madden. And so my first reaction to Sonia Friedman, because she offered it to me, was, well, I'm, I'm very busy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she said, I think you should go home and have a think, think about that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm busy. I've got a show. And I would never put out of a show. I I've, I've once before in my career pulled out of a show. And that was also, that was because of, there was, it was a, and it didn't do me very good, actually. It, uh, it was a show where, um, I was doing down at Chichester. It was, I think, a three thousand pound fee, and I was actually, as I was telling you, I was hugely, hugely, hugely in debt. And I suddenly got the offer of doing Nicole Kidman in Photograph Fifty One in the West End, which a the fee was uh, twice that at least, yeah. but b Nicole had agreed to do twelve weeks in the West End, and that was bound to be a sellout, and therefore there was going to be a royalty attached, and that was the only time in my career that I've called up a director and said until Potter obviously but that was the only time I called up a director and said I'm in real dire straits financially and I think I need to ask you something I've never asked anyone before which is would you let me out to that show it was still nine months away there was still time to meet everyone but my god I felt you know I could feel my heart going like this because I was yeah. like I don't I shouldn't be doing this and he very sweetly uh it was Mike Attenborough who used to run the um um, used to run the Almeida, so he said, darling, darling, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was a good decision because that then got me back onto a yeah. level playing field. I then had paid off that credit card debt. I was back at zero in my bank account and I, I didn't feel like I was um, uh, um, drowning, actually. Yeah. Drowning, yeah. going from job to job, but never, ever increasing anything you know there was no pension going on at this stage there was nothing nothing um so yes yeah, so then i um so i had to call up ken branner 
and I thought, well, I've, I've done this once before, but I caught, so I called up Ken and I, I said, Ken, look, I'm being offered a show and I'm not allowed to tell you what it is yet, of course, because there was a huge secrecy around Potter at that stage that it was even happening. He was distinctly unimpressed and told me so down the phone uh, uh, about it. And we'd done quite a few shows together at this stage. We knew each other quite well. And I, and I said to him, well, Ken, look, do you remember about eight years ago, you and I were supposed to be doing Hamlet in the West End with Jude Law for the Donmar. And you called me up and said, look, I've just been offered um, Thor by Marvel. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm afraid uh, it's the difference, you know, in, instead of the £6,000 fee from the Donmar to direct a show it's uh, in the West End, it is um, probably millions to him, I imagine. Uh, anyway, he said, so I'm going to have to step away from the project. I'm terribly sorry, Michael will take over. So Michael Grandier's ended up directing that. Anyway, Ken had, had um, forgotten about this. So I was able to, as he uh, was less than impressed that I was putting out a review in Joliet, I was able to remind him, I said, look, this is my equivalent of Thor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, at which point he said, well, I think, okay, I've forgotten about that. I suppose I owe you one. I mean, you know, when you said about Harry Potter and like, oh, I'm really busy, uh, you know, sort of famously, you didn't know a lot about Harry Potter as such, but, did you know, did you understand the, the scale of the franchise? Like No! <laughs> I had no idea. I thought it was a kid's show. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I've never read the books. I've never seen the films still to this moment. There was this amazing moment where three days after Swan had offered it, I met up with John Tiffany, the director. So I'm in the middle of a big West End musical. You know, we're working from 9 a.m. in the morning till, well, the show ends at 11, and then we do notes until probably two o'clock in the morning, the, the mm. call for the 18 because it's a brand new musical and all that shit that goes on with a brand new musical where, you know, you're in all the meetings about the number that used to be in, in Act Two is now in Act One, and it's split up to three places, and you're thinking, fuck, how do we do this next week? And, you know, what will solve the story? Da, 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 da. So all those meetings are going on. And so funnily enough, I haven't done any research about this. So I sit down at this quick lunchtime meeting, grabbed half an hour, and I said, look, the first thing you need to know is I'm really sorry, but I actually know nothing about this. And John was like, what? Seriously? I was like, yeah, I've never read the books. I've never seen the film. It's like, okay. That's really useful. Don't, <laughs> don't ever read them. You can be the one member of the team who doesn't understand and you can represent the grandparents who are taking their grandchildren as a treat and you can tell us when it doesn't make sense. So that's it. Basically, I represented the octogenarians in the audience. <laughs> and there were moments, there were moments in rehearsals where he'd send me off into a, into a huddle with Jack Thorne to, to figure out why I didn't understand what the hell, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. God. Any of those things. But also I employed, a, I employed an assistant who was a geek um, so that I could at certain moments have cans go, what God does this spell? <laughs> I mean, what, so before we sort of, I want to talk about your process in a minute, but, but do you think uh, on the sort of work-life balancing, do you think now that we've had this period of absolutely nothing, do you feel differently about that balance now? Or do you think so much of what we do is just because it's dictated by necessity and I want to progress, it'll never change? There are all sorts of fantastic conversations going on. I was uh, early in early involved in freelancers make theatre work and I did the first uh, few months of setting that up and uh, ran the website and was doing the newsletters and stuff and there were some you know we were dealing with the um we were dealing with the immediate and the chronic and as we were talking about the sort of chronic long-term issues of the industry one of the things that kept coming up was work-life balance and uh for Parents, Fred, you know, how do you deal with, um, how do you deal with uh, childcare for all of us? Uh, why do we have to work evenings and weekends? And, you know, there was some glorious blue sky thinking saying, well, let's never ever, I, I've always said, I've always said, I hate evening tech sessions. Evening tech sessions ruin my life. Lighting, sound, video designers are entirely different to the rest of the industry. We go from tech to tech to tech making our money during the technical rehearsal period. Yeah. And that's very, very bad on your lifestyle. That's why I was irresponsible with my choice of career for my American German girlfriend, uh, because I was never there. Yeah. And, and, to f and, and you know, there was one year where I did 24 shows in a year touring around uh, after she dumped me, obviously, uh, because one couldn't have had a relationship and managed to do 24 shows around the regions in that year. But I was, 
uh, I would open a show on a Wednesday night, travel the next day to whichever next theater I was in. And on a Thursday would watch rehearsals, a Friday would watch rehearsals, uh, drawing the, you know, finishing the plan off and be, be there with them as they did the final rehearsals on Saturday. And then Sunday night, you'd probably be focusing and Monday you'd be teching and uh, going through to previews. And then you'd go through the whole process again. And I was basically living out of digs and a, and a suitcase for quite a few years. And it's, that isn't sustainable. And that was quite hard. And I look at the photographs of me now and I realize that I was looking pretty gaunt and uh, quite tired. Um, you know, but at the time I thought I was also living the dream. I was actually, being, people were foolish enough to give me a job lighting their shows. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to put them right. I was going to try and do the best I could, but I thought, really, guys, I have no idea what I'm doing here. You know, it's, uh, and I still think that to, the, to this day, you know, every project you do, you're just like, I don't know how to do this. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I can achieve this, but I probably ought to show that. <laughs> I mean, do you still um, do you still get excited when someone comes to you with a project? Is it still an exciting moment when they offer it to you? Yes, I mean most projects. Yes, yeah, um, yeah the free son of excitement. I, I just. You know, maybe this is this industry going to start up next year? God, I don't know. But I just got an availability check for something that made me go, oh, I love that. I love that show. And it's next year in May. And oh, great. And it was interesting. I, and I called up my program of production electrician and said, look, who knows if we will be able to do this, but this has just come through. And the two of them did the same. They both sort of went, oh, good. Because also it gave us, a, at this moment especially, it gave us a... Um, gave us a kind of a start point for maybe going back to work. Yeah, yeah. I think what's debilitating, and I found it, you know, that, 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 that sofa has seen quite a few freelancers afternoon snoozes, I tell you, over the last six months. Oh my God. Cash in the attic. Yeah, uh, yeah you, it's, I have fallen asleep through all that brilliant afternoon TV on the BBC. Um, but it's debil it is debilitating. I, you know, trying to find a motivation to to keep your uh, to keep your mental energy in a good place. Yeah, oh, that yeah. sounds really that sounds really woo, doesn't it? But it's not meant to be. But you know, just trying to trying to trying to stay positive has been quite hard. Yeah. And so to suddenly have something like that come in, and you could see everybody else suddenly go, oh, oh, okay. Now I sort of maybe have a date that I know that, you know, because the whole way through this we've been going, how long do my savings need to last? What else do I need to do? How else can I earn money? When will this be back to normal? Yeah. Will it ever be back to normal? Yeah. You know, who knows? I don't know. And we're so good at aiming for deadlines and stuff. I mean, just having something to sort of, you know, this sort of uh, constant unknown is, is almost the problem. Like you say, it's, it's that thing that you're like, well, we're aiming for that. So at least I can plan for that yeah i mean I, and i have to say i think i am um I, I get bored so easily i think that's why i enjoy this career because it's um on to something else you know you you do something you achieve it it's not a long in general it's not a it's not a massive gestation period I mean, when I was at Imagination, there were two departments. There was, um, I was only ever freelancing there, sorry, when I say that, but there was the, there was the, uh, and there was the, the, the conference lighting department that sort of, they did, you know, um, uh, so they would do the presentations and the motor shows and shit like that. And then there was the architectural department. And I remember over the course of the sort of five, six years of me dipping in and out of that country, doing event after event after event, uh, a company uh, doing event after event after event, the architectural lighting department, were still working on the first Disney ship at the end of the six years. I mean, that would drive me insane. I do not have the, I don't think I have the concentration to do that. And I think that's probably also why this career appe appeals in some ways, because it is quick project achieved. So quick hit of high, Start again. Okay, another high, but you know it's not it's not that long slog, and I think this is this has been a long slog for all of us for so many reasons. So. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned um, uh, cash and attic and all your naps, Tom. I wonder if this is a good point. You had a question, if you're able to. Um, I I don't know about everyone's questions in advance, but Tom did mention these in case he cut out. Tom. Oh, Tom's oh, gone. Hello. 
No, I'm. I am still here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. You can hear me. Cool. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to have to find find it a second. I had a question about um, uh, Roadkill. Um, Rory said that you, you'd watch watch Roadkill, uh, oh, yes. and I I devoured it all last night. I meant to only watch one episode, but uh, yeah, here I we know. Are. Me too. Um, I, I watched the first the night before, and I watched it all last night. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know, uh, I was so distracted by all the blues and ambers in literally every scene. Uh, so what do you think TV could learn from theatre lighting? And do you see a future where lighting design for streamed or recorded theatre becomes a sub or specialist discipline? Sorry, that was a bit wordy. Well, uh, uh, um, streaming, the lighting for streaming is already a sub sub-discipline. Uh, there are a few people who get pulled in for every NT Live or its equivalent um, to come and adapt your lighting to do it. Um, something that will, that will be taught in drama schools going forwards from this point. Do you think that they might have seen the value of it and that that, that will then be a, a taught module? I, ad I admire your faith that the drama schools are paying <laughs> that much attention into what is going on in the real world. <laughs> Um, As a fellow Guildhall alumni, I, I understand that. Oh well, the, <laughs> Guildhall, Guildhall, obviously, you know, is one of the one of the better ones. But um, no, I, hmm, yes, I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to be rude, Tom, but I, 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 I love, I love the naivety of that question. <laughs> um, no, I think you're right. I think they ought to, and they ought to be doing. And frankly, I find it kind of amazing that all these colleges concentrate so much on theatre when so few of their graduates, because could I just say we're probably producing way too many graduates each year in theatre for the amount of jobs that are available. So something's happening to those graduates. Some of them go out and they take this kind of great training and they go and do something else entirely, but lots go out to other sections of the industry. So they should be teaching more about lighting for camera and film. And maybe they are, they, but they certainly weren't Bloody bloody blah, blah years ago when I was at them. So, um, but yeah, it should it should be it should be a discipline. I mean, it's the same in some ways. You just have to never look with your bare eyes. You always have to look at the screen. I did a, a years ago actually for weirdly for a match again, but um, I got thrown in because someone was ill. I got thrown in to do the 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 last pilot and the first program of their redesign of Newsnight. It was a terrible redesign that I think lasted for only two years before they got into the current design. But it was an eye-opener because I was suddenly thrown into the BBC amongst all those BBC lifers who all wore um, Farrah's and Hush Puppies. That probably means nothing to your generation. But anyway, look up Farrah's and Hush Puppies. It's a particular type of um, dress code and person. Uh, they'd all been in there for, you know, 40 years or whatever. And Newsnight being a nightly program, was on a roster uh, system in, in Studio 7. So in a, in a studio that during the day did three other programs. It did part of the breakfast and did one of the lunchtime business programs and then did an afternoon kids thing in the corner and then did news, news night. Go away. <laughs> um, leave me alone. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so the, it was kind of interesting to, to suddenly be thrown into that environment, but, but, but in amongst it, it was, um, it was odd for the first time to be in a in a gallery and you always imagine because you see them in film you know the gallery the gallery gallery actually overlooks the studio this gallery didn't overlook the studio you just had an akamichi monitor and you had to rely on that and i remember balancing to what i thought would be good and they wanted a quite theatrical look to it so they wanted quite strong contrast as much as the camera can deal with and quite strong colors and i got it to a stage where i thought yeah i'd be happy with that 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 i think is looking okay and but the percentages on the galaxy, it was a galaxy, a strand galaxy in those days, were kind of odd. And then I walked down into the studio, down onto the catwalk and down, and, and looked at the state that I created. And it was extraordinary. The blue background was sort of, you know, it's like at 80%. It was really, really vivid. And the face light was at about 13%, you know, the kind of equivalent of a tungsten lamp at 30%, this sort of minimal orange glow. And your eye would not have ever um you would never have made that balance like that it looked awful to the eye and yet it looked absolutely fine on the camera also the upshot to that story was uh uh Farrah's and hush puppies said to me well 
doesn't matter what you do tonight and tomorrow for the first program. So there are eight of us who uh, who have the roster on this. We'll just go back to what we did anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Hi. Uh, no, I was just going to say. Let's I think I'm rambling. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine, and that's what we're here for. Um, so let's talk a bit about your process. If we start at the very beginning. When do you first hear about a gig? I mean, you said there Harry Potter was like 13 months in advance. Are plays a lot shorter? Well, um, Harry Potter is a play to start with. It's not a musical. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry. Be your research beaten. Yeah. Um, <laughs> God, everyone thinks it's a musical. Everyone gets disappointed there are no songs. And I just can't imagine, like, what did they think? There was going to be a, a tap line number with some broomsticks used yeah. like canes a la Fred Astaire. I mean, what, what would that have been like? I've been waiting Apparently, for it. Every, every, everyone who went to Joe Rowling before, um, uh, before Sonny Friedman and Colin Canada went uh, with this idea, uh, everyone who went to, went to uh, Joe Rowling uh, wanted to do a musical of Harry Potter. I was thinking, Shh, terrible, terrible, terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> Although, wouldn't you love to see some of those pictures? Yeah. Um, hey, look, it depends. Um, what you should never ever be worried about is your never first dibs for any show or your very seldom first dibs for any show. Um, uh, there might be some very loyal directors you work with or designers who will insist and isn't that lovely. But in general, someone else has said no first or I'm not available and they come down the line and they find you, you know, it happens like that. I, Harry Potter, that was certainly the case. Um, uh you know other people couldn't the date the dates moved and whoever was involved with it before couldn't be um couldn't be involved again so um you can't be precious about that but yes in terms of when in the process sometimes it's really 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 early in fact i have been employed on occasion before the scenic and costume designer and asked by the director who i feel would be right or uh to do it and that's quite interesting because that doesn't often happen in general the hierarchy, and I don't like that there is one, but the hierarchy is that set and costume designer in the UK sort of gets employed first and then everyone else comes from that. I see it as more linear. Um, yes, the director sort of has the, um, has the final say, but I feel it's an utterly linear structure underneath set designer, costume designer, lighting designer, sound designer, video designer, hair designer, wig and makeup designer. Mm illusion designer, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. I feel that all India, all those people bring something to it uh, because there's such a deep collaboration between lighting and set and costume. Um, and at its most minimal, those are probably the only three that get employed. Those, they, they, they end up being quite cool. But I, I think, I think uh, that's almost a little triumvirate, the director and set costume. In the UK, it's always, almost always set costume. In the US, it's set designer. Costume designer is almost never the same person. They find it very strange that we make it the same person. And frankly, we make it the same person because that uh, produces convenience to uh, employ less people. Uh, but yes, the triumvirate of those three people, I feel that in, um, in a careful, um, thoughtful way, notes can go in any direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, not, I'm not shy about saying if I think a section of the show isn't working. And I think that this is how we can maybe make it work if that affects the director's work or the set and costume designer's work, whatever it may be that, you know, so long as you are diplomatic, because that's what really matters. You're working with these people in a very pressured environment and you're, you all have skills. The one thing about lighting, lighting designers especially is we've done more shows than anybody else. Whatever situation is coming up on, on stage, we're probably the we're most likely person, no matter how rare it is, and the most likely person to have experienced it before, yeah. to have been in a situation where we have a little bit of knowledge that goes, oh, maybe that could be sorted like this. Maybe that could be, that reminds me of a da-da-da. Oh, yes, no, I've done this before, and I tell you why that won't work is because of this, but if we did this, then da-da-da. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of skill set there just through sheer volume of productions you've been involved in. I mean, I, I, I'm not even bothered to count, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to 300, uh, yeah. you know, and that's, that's how old I am, but also that's how many shows you have to do as a lighting designer. Um, yeah. Yeah. Whereas you think, you know, you think a director would, should really probably be doing no more than three 
shows a year. A designer ought to be doing no more than sort of six to eight. And a lighting designer does somewhere between 12 and, well, 24 at the absolute worst. I mean, I know a set designer in America who actually managed to do um, 22 productions last year, but he never stayed past uh, the first preview. Okay. And he has a, tea, a huge team of associates that do a lot of the work for him. So. Yeah. And, and I mean, like in normal times, I mean, if you're approached by something that's, that's years away, as it were, um, yes. how, how much headspace do you give that early doors, considering you're obviously going to be working on other stuff that's more immediate? Yeah. Um, oh, there's the politic answer and there's the real answer, isn't there? So the real answer is not much. Yeah. Is it a project that I think is interesting with some collaborators that I either know or am intrigued by their work and want to work with. Yeah. Yes, boom, done. They might send me the script then, but it'll be a while before that script gets read. Um, and in general, what will happen is, you know, three months later, they'll suddenly say, oh, could you come tomorrow morning and come and see the model? And you're like, oh, bollocks, I haven't read the script. So you try and, you know, skim it that night and and to get yourself up to up to speed or that first meeting i mean look there, there are very very salutary lessons in this to everybody don't 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 do what i uh, do um do what i say which is make sure you read the script so one of those occasions that phone call comes through and i'm of course as ever as one always is in tech and in tech till 11 o'clock at night and so can i go and have a meeting about um terry johnson's insignificance tomorrow and see the model that's been produced uh, it's a tour starting in um in sheffield so i set my alarm early the next morning i have to have the meeting between 9 and 10 a.m because i've got to be back in the theater but they're, they're, they're fine with that so i set my alarm for 6 a.m i think got to read this really quickly i snooze it i roll over you know there's a there's a theme here i like sleep um or i was very tired um i snooze i snooze and snooze and eventually i'm like oh bollocks, i've got to get up now i haven't left myself enough time to read the script so there I am, scene one, da, 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 yeah, hotel room, fine. Joe DiMaggio, Marilyn Monroe, Albert Einstein, Senator McCarthy in a hotel room. Conversation coming, yeah, fine, 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 scene two, yeah, okay. Hotel room, still the same four, okay, only those four characters, right, fine, yeah, only those four characters, hotel room, yeah, yeah, okay, fine, fine, skim, 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 fine, great. Final scene, same sort of, sort of shit. So I go to the meeting and we're looking at it and there is this very beautiful hotel room, slightly skew, lovely windows, a lot of ability to get light shafting through, uh, net curtains, bed, everything you think about a sort of 1940s uh, hotel room. But it's sitting in this kind of glorious, abstracted, curved mirror surround that is definitely not telling you anything about time and place. And you think, well, that's kind of beautiful I could make that glow and be interesting you've got to be very careful about reflections but you know interesting so I think this is great this is good and then they suddenly turned to me in the meeting and they said look we really need your help with this bit though how on earth are you going to do the neutron bomb <laughs> I'm sorry the neutron bomb on the very last page of the script at the very end of the play in the stage directions after the last little word line, it says that as Albert Einstein exits, having given this very deep uh, description to Marilyn Monroe, Marilyn Monroe imagines what he has just described and realizes that it is the neutron bomb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, balls, yeah. So let that be a lesson. You probably ought to read the script. So I did have a little bit of egg on my face, uh, but I had to hold my hands up and went very red and went, I didn't get that far, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Anyway, look, the neutron bomb, when it came to it, what really mattered was the neutron bomb was bloody great when it happened. I had about, I think I had eight Martin Atomic strobes facing just behind the props, facing upstage into these weird curved mirrors. And it was really hard to plot, but it was, basically um, a whole load of slightly mistimed between each of them and it became this absolutely sickening, rolling, strobing, it made you feel ill and some massive fans outside the window blowing the curtains and, the, and some huge flashes from outside there as well. So what matters is eventually the neutron bomb was great but uh, I didn't really uh, quit myself brilliantly in that first meeting. So there you are, read the script.
Yeah, gosh. And, and did, when you when you then moved to the next bit, were you uh, a sort of research and things? I mean, what do you do? Visual research? Do you do any research? Is it fairly instinctive? What do you tend to do? I'm going to get myself into trouble here because what I'm going to say is bollocks to research. Um, uh, it's something that they teach in the colleges as a way of helping you maybe, I, I, am, I think from what I've seen, I didn't go and do that sort of course myself. It didn't exist when I was there. There were no lighting design courses back then. Um, but uh, it's a good way of trying to provoke conversations about visual language and all the rest of it. One of the great problems of lighting is, is it is invisible uh, yeah. until it hits something and to, it is also quite difficult to describe. It's pretty much indescribable actually as well. So it's very hard for people to imagine what you've got beforehand. So sometimes I think those research projects are about trying to give a sense to the rest of the um, trainee team in a college about how to what 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 it is you'll be doing before you get into the space yeah uh, the reality of the job is um you're being relied on for your um past experience your imagination your visual dynamic your visual language i mean it's hard isn't it some people say oh what's your style and i'm not sure i know but someone else does and i suppose that's why you get the jobs but i couldn't describe it to you i don't know what it is i just try to make the the i try to make the visuals as dying where's that coming from that's annoying isn't it? uh the visuals as dynamic as possible i i'm look i told you i get bored yeah. and i get visual, i get visually bored as well yeah. And so if you're in one environment in a, in, a, in, in a set for a long time, if I were a member of the audience, I would have trouble concentrating after a while, yeah. Yeah. unless the, the visual environment is helping me um, be interested and in presenting the actor to me and pushing the actor out towards the audience and helping, helping tell the story. We're all storytellers. We're not lighting designers. We're storytellers who happen to specialize in a knowledge of lighting. And that's also why in that triumvirate, the, the notes and the thoughts can go in any direction because we're yeah. all storytellers. We've all got an amazing experience with that. But uh, what was the question? I've forgotten. I'm rambling. It was, it was a, you've answered it. It was about research. But my point was basically well, people would assume that you do a swathes of research and that's not necessarily. Well, no, I've just told you with Harry Potter, I absolutely didn't. Uh, 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 but, you know, there were the research was different. It, it's. Um, <sighs> There are many actors who also won't, will be instinctive and will not do masses of research, but it's interesting to talk around the subject. You need to know something about the subject to, um, this reflection is really annoying. Um, that would be no good on camera. Um, but, so glib as that answer is, here's the thing. I think I am doing my research but I'm doing it not project specific. Yeah. Because you need a visual language that you can talk to directors and designers using. And that will be uh, often, you know, oh, did you see the last Pina Bausch show? Did you see the, the um, uh, William Forsyth's last uh, piece? Yeah. So in, in a good way, it's, in some ways it's about other bits of theatre. Oh my God, this is an extraordinary thing I saw in Complicity show. I want to use it. That was one of the, that came up just recently actually in a show. Um, or it's, well, our inspiration for this, um, this set is Hamashoi. Yeah. And you've got to know what that means. And if you don't, you need to go and do some research at that moment. So you need to make sure you are versed in all the influences that will um, that will be playing on designer and lighting designer, and you know, it's supposed to, you know, we really, we really want a Dan Flavin sort of look here. This should really be, you know, what, whatever it may be. You've got to know who those people are and understand who that is. It's your job to have. So this is the other side of it. I'm, I'm glib that, uh, about it, but actually, there's a massive amount of research going on. I mean, that's what that. Oh, hang on. Oh, I'm about to collapse my desk here. Oh, bollocks. Hang on. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, but, you know, that's 
that's what that bookshelf is all about. You know, that is all art books. That is all photography books. That is all. And in fact, there's another one over here that you can't see, but this, this gets repeated on this side of the room. Um, and that's full of references, art tomes. Uh, it's about sculptors and photographers and artists and uh, visual artists. And, and then, you know, and then you need to understand your own medium as well. Yeah. Anyway, you need to understand your own medium because bloody hell, if you're not interested in theatre, get out now. It's If you're not interested in it and you're going to spend, I have spent more time in a theatre than I have spent with any friends or any partner over the last years since I started this. So my God, you need to be interested in it as a, as a, as a medium. You need to want to go and see other people's work. You need to be inspired by it because I think otherwise you're going to be... Otherwise doesn't pay very well and until unless you have a chance at success and let's face it that is uh that's the equivalent of the one percent and it's probably the point one percent in theater uh, that chance of, of getting that so it's got to be something that inspires you and in and uh, interests you in itself yeah yeah <clears throat> um i was oh, i'm rambling i'm so sorry yes no you're not that's totally fine um so I've had oh, a it's lot been all about work-life balance. We said we weren't going to do anything about work-life balance, but there we I are. I know, I know. It's, so, it's brilliant. Um, so I, I've asked quite a lot of people how they deal with um, awkward set designs and so on. But actually, I'm going to... Awkward do set a... designers or awkward set designs? Designs. Uh... Oh, sorry, designs, right. Sorry, sorry. I just wanted to get that clear. But, Didn't want to name names. <laughs> well, I wonder if we could ask you it in a different way. Could you tell us about your relationship with Christopher Oram? and uh, your sort of unique way of tackling his sets. Yeah, Christopher Oram. Yeah. So I've done, I've worked with Christopher since, I think 2001. Basically there was one director, this is interesting about career actually as well. So uh, one director I worked with on the fringe who ended up making it and he ended up uh, becoming a director of a fringe theatre, The Gate, in Notting Hill, which was highly thought of at the time because Stephen Daldry had been there, two artistic directors before him. Uh, so it was very well thought of. Um, he became artistic director of that and then from that got some large amounts of work uh, uh, abroad and then bigger and bigger work in the UK and took me all the way to the National Theatre. And then he slightly imploded and, um, and I thought I was back at square one again, but the next job after that show at the National Theatre was with this extraordinarily grumpy, um, quite poker-faced set designer. I certainly didn't know that he was ever happy. I thought he was always quite angry with what I was doing for his work. Um, but it was an opera at the Almeida. And anyway, that turned out to be Christopher Oram. And that set was set in the catafalque, uh, sorry, sorry set, in the, set in the tomb of Lenin in Red Square. It was a brilliant opera. It was a one-person opera, all spoken, uh, with a, it was weird modern Italian squeaky gate kind of music. Uh, Ian McDermott, uh, Emperor of the Universe, for those of you who, uh, who are Star Wars fans, uh, Ian McDermott uh, played the embalmer, it was called, the embalmer, and he was the embalmer, and he starts off at the top and he comes into the mausoleum and is in charge of embalming Lenin's body overnight. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Red Square. It's extraordinary. So you, you go and you see and you walk in and there's this dodgy sort of pink light trying to make the body of Lenin lying there in the catafalque uh, look still lifelike because uh, he's obviously gone grey as shit over the years with the amount of uh, embalming fluid inside. It's uh, it's all rather wonderful and you have to do a quick wander around and then out the other side and you're not allowed to take photographs. Oh, very, I did. But, <laughs> um, and that wasn't to do research, that was just because I happened to be in Moscow anyway. But, uh, um, anyway. So I knew that I knew what it was like inside there. Um, but yes, he's supposed to at the beginning of the show walk in to a sealed room that is sealed, get locked in, deal with embalming Lenin. But he's too busy talking about how his marriage is failing. He might as well work in theatre, um, and uh, and forget to embalm Lenin's body. Does it all wrong, and this catafalque with Lenin's body in it, sort of lying there, this basically dummy that's been there the entire time, has to, as part of the opera, start to disappear into puffs of dust. So it was brilliant. There was a some poor crew member who had to lie underneath the catapult for the entire hour and a half of the opera, and able to slowly pull through 
the shoe and push up a little puff of flour. Bit by bit, the body would disappear until the embalmer is left with one, um, uh, until the embalmer is left with, uh, with, with one decision, which is the only way around this, is for him to make himself up as Lenin, lie down in the catapult and replace the, the atomized body and embalm himself. It's weird and dark and kind of wonderful. Now, the point about the mausoleum is it had to be sealed. And the first thing I did was said to Christopher, huh, well, I can't get any cross light in here. I'll have, to cut a, I'll have to cut some holes in this wall. And rather brilliantly, he let me, and we found a way of masking them with a bit of like a, a, a pillar. So they were just up stage of a pillar. But that became the beginning of a relationship with him where he says there is not a, in the last 19 years, there's not a set of his that I haven't cut a hole in. And I think that's probably true. That is the first thing you know, he basically goes, he hands me the scalpel when I arrive at the white car model and goes, all right, where? <laughs> but frankly, that should be the relationship because their, their skill is physical environment and providing a great, uh, a great visual image. Our skill should be understanding what that needs to look like and how to make that look interesting. And therefore we need to say, well, in order for this to look like the way you are imagining it, there are some things that need to change. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we've just been through it on, on company, which I did in, in America where, um, and in London uh, a year before that, um, where Bunny designed um, five-sided boxes, the entire, the entire, yes, five-sided, oh God, I can't even do much. You see, look, I've just lost, lost all geometry. Um, but yeah, so the entire show is in tiny, tiny boxes. Uh, the entire time and so my first um point to her was well okay we're going to need to cut a slot at the back we need to cut a slot at the front but i think the way of getting around the slot at the back is if we you know if you continue the back wall up and at the sides then what the audience sees is um what you as the audience see oh dear can we do this is that still which looks like the inside of a box what you don't understand is the difference between that and that yeah it still feels like there's an edge there. But meanwhile, I managed to get some lights in there. So, oh, look, this is a great book. Who knew this was even a book that you could write this much about? Lighting the Shakespearean stage. Anyway. I, um, how did you, did you, did you have to do the maths on those boxes? Or how did you work out? Did I have to do what, what, what? Did you do the maths on those boxes in company? Yes, or, or yes about figuring what I wanted and where it was visual, uh, well, yeah, so yes, I did that. So there was a slot at the front and the back and we, we can talk about that. I've got some, I've got, got some pictures. Yeah, 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 we'll do that. So I wanted to talk about um, the cotton holes thing still. Um, one of the shows that sticks in my mind as a really great example of collaboration is Macbeth in Manchester. I wonder if you could talk to us about that. Oh, yes. Yes, I can. Well, there's, so I, I do it with other designers as well. There's, there, just very quickly, there's a 12th night I did down in Bristol ages ago and it was all about uh it was done you know that Havana book it's up, up there on the shelf somewhere um it's the um oh. oh shit there was a period in set design where you um where you knew if someone had this book Robert Polidori's Havana it's a glorious book from the sort of 90s of these amazing amazing dilapidated Havana glorious interiors um, yes. and basically it looks that the set looked basically like the front cover I think that designer hadn't afforded the book but had basically looked at it in the in the bookshop yeah but it looked like this but with more uh, lath and plaster uh, or lath work showing through where the plaster had fallen mm. off and there was one specific moment where there was one of the one of the uh, Malvolio monologues um, going on it was just really hard there was almost this perfect image I had lots of 5Ks just outside the set coming through that lath and plaster work. But there was this slightly annoying, during this Malvolio speech, there was a slightly annoying line that would occasionally, if he stood in the wrong place. So I said to the designer, do you mind? And I went and took the circular saw and just went, yeah. <laughs> great. That was now head sized, that shaft that came through and it was, it was never a problem again. And it looked great. That is <laughs> brilliant. Don't be scared. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the holes where you want them. Um, yeah, so, well, should we, wait. shall I do the case study of Maccas in Manchester? Is that boring or should we? No, it's not at all. It's really interesting. Well, 
Right. There are all sorts of. I mean, I've got lots of case studies. If you're all dull and you want to, if you're bored and you want to go, um, go home and do do shout. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. You should yeah. be seeing a whole load of nonsense here. So, um, yeah, goodness, I don't know where I want to go. I want to go here, and I want to go to Myth. Here we are. So, Manchester International Festival, uh, a brilliant uh, biennial festival. Is that right? Comes up yeah. every two years, rather than a biannual, which would be every twice a year. Anyway, yes, biennial. Um, Ken Branner wanted to do Macbeth. He'd wanted to do it two years previous, but then had got a job. And we'd been to see this very derelict area of Manchester called Ancoats, which was lots and lots of old um, sugar warehouses and uh, but burning cars on the street. And um, I mean, it looked like a movie set. There were people jacking up, burning cars on the street and this derelict church. And we went into this derelict church and thought, oh my God, this is it. I mean, that is our set. That's great. Anyway, Ken got a job. Two years later came around and the festival said, great, let's do it this year. We went back. Unfortunately, the Halle Orchestra had bought the church and uh, a couple of bits of development had gone on in the, in the previous two years. And um, they'd got an awful lot of lottery money to make the church into their rehearsal studio. So it had gone from being this completely derelict, smashed windows, extraordinary environment where you went, oh my God, I could do my best right here and now, to this slightly, um, well, I mean, look at it, it's, it's, it there's, there's, there's nothing left of any atmosphere there. Mm -hmm. So then uh, Christopher decided that he would, the way to use it would be take down all of this. Can you see this, all of you? Yes. Is it big enough? I hope so. Yes. Yeah. Um, take down all these weird um, acoustic panels and all of these holophane lights and design a sort of like jousting uh, area. So the audience would sit either side in banks, the actors could enter here, or here, or obviously up here from the name, from the, oh, who knows about churches? Is this the name or is that, I don't know, whatever, you know. Um, and this was all gonna be filled with mud. That entire area was filled with mud. You can imagine how the Halle Orchestra uh, general manager's face said when we said it was going to mud. Because then also we said, it's not just gonna be mud, but for the first five minutes of the show, it's going to rain inside the church. On that exceptionally expensive, parquet acoustic floor that they've just laid down. They hated us. Anyway, so that was the idea. That's what it looked like. And we thought, well, we will still use the architecture of the church. Shaft through those windows, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the idea. This is looking the other way, looking towards the big rose window. And the only intervention really we were doing scenic wise was that, uh, which covered up a little corridor for the actors to get through. And these three doors that would open up where the three witches would, you know, suddenly appear and suddenly disappear. Um, so I went up to the church and did some tests. This is, this is an early test of on a genie poking a park and through the windows, looking at how we might rig it and then thinking about it. And this is how it ended up. And you can see there that we've boarded up the windows and we've done some terrible acro props between, between the windows, a bit old, great big, long meter and a half long D-rig arm and an arrow, uh, uh, not waterproof. So we had to, we, we, if it was raining, we kept them glowing uh, overnight to make sure that the, uh, the can uh, didn't fill up with water and evaporated anything going into it. And then you can see the la world's largest amount of black wrap there. Sorry, it's a bit of a fuzzy photo when you go in this closely, but uh, no. to, to try and break it in. So there you are, lovely shafts to do in there. There's, there's one thing done. Um, no apertures cut yet. Then through that big, through these three windows here, I wanted to get three shafts of light, but eventually budget said it was one shaft of light through the center. And well, that meant that on the sweet shop over the road, we had to get permission to build this scaffolding structure on their roof in order to take this one eco dome with one very cheap but very bright, bright clay packy unit in it to shaft through the window. So that was kind of brilliant uh, and fun. So there you are, there's the shaft through that window. 
yeah. at the other end to come through the rose window because there was that beautiful rose window I pointed out. Well, when we'd finished focusing, every night we would send up the genie with a <laughs> lamp strapped to it. And in the interval, it would have a, um, a focus that you had to line up with a certain section of the, that wasn't coming through the window so the audience didn't know we were focusing during the interval, but we then, you know, you'd swing from the bottom, you'd swing the genie back and forth until you got, and got it high enough until that was in the right place. And then you knew that you were in the right place for it to do its, uh, its lineup. So we had a kind of lineup where we were moving the genie and not the lamp, hilariously. Um, yes, and that was how we did the shaft through the other end. Um, so that's what that resulted in. There you are. Oh, also, by the way, those are 300 candles at the end there. And they were all lit. They were real candles and they were lit at the beginning of the show. That was a, a one hour preset for one ASM to light the 300 candles. So when the audience came in, they were glowing like this. You can see them there. But then as the first murder happened, all those candles in unison had to blow out. So Howard Eaton had the glorious job of rigging silicon tubes at the back of every single candle cutting them through into the base well, checking that they hadn't filled up with wax from the night before. And then there was a CO2 handle. And so we would blast CO2 uh, covered by a sound effect of a great big gasp as, the, as Duncan is killed. And all the candles would suddenly just snuff. Out. Really? Uh, yeah, silly things that happen in theater. None, none of this is particular. But here you are, look, there's the, um, there is that light from over on the sweet shop roof shafting through also can you see i don't know if this is coming through your screens but look how muddy this is the dress rehearsal we had to change that entire mud mix because look how muddy that is down there it took the most amazing photographs but basically the actors started to walk in iambic pentameter because it was going <laughs> as they walked you couldn't hear anything but squelchy wellington folks um yes so looking in the other direction at the witches, sorry. Before you, before you do it, Neil, I was just going to ask you about that photo you're on now. Um, yes. You, there's a whole thing about you hiding units here, isn't there? Oh, yeah, well, here you are. So I can show you the plan of this, actually, as well, which might bore you all to tears as well. So, um, there's the lighting plan. So not much money, not much rigging position. The idea was that we were taking away those those triangular panels and the holophane lights in order to open up the roof of the church. So we, yeah. they, we didn't want to, not that there was anywhere to rig it from, but we didn't want to have truss up there. We didn't want to, and that's why I was using the windows from outside. I'm trying to utilize what's there to get some light into the space. So I decided that what I was going to do was around each of the columns that existed, rig off the back of the column. You can see there's the column and there's the bar off the back. Rig a couple of revolutions either side that would sort of put their noses back behind the architecture that would still just allow, they would be at just the right height to get a reasonable shot at the stage without blinding the people opposite. Somewhere there'll be some working out of this. Oh, look, there you are. Some very colorful working out. <laughs> um, there's the church, but you can see here. So I'm, oh. Yes, that's the back wall. It was going to be all muddy hands. Um, so you can see here, those those the uh, paths that we were looking at outside the window that, and they're giving this sort of, if I were to fill that in solid, they're giving that shaft onto the stage. Yeah. And then I was looking at, um, there are the revolutions hanging from the cap, the top of the capital columns within the, uh, within the theater. And they're just capable of, they don't quite cover a person standing at six foot on the other side without spilling over the top of the handrail, but they don't really blind the audience. That's fine. And then I thought, well, we'll do a little, little pipe in all four corners to give be able to give some kind of shaft. So there's basically very limited amounts of lighting going on there, as you can see from the plan. There are four corner booms now highlighted in orange, sitting at each corner. That's that's actually where they're sitting. There's the stuff we talked about, the sweet shop light over there, the light on the genie over there, the arrows through the windows there. And then here we've got revolutions. Now they're all moving lights. So there's expense here, but 
they're all moving lights because my god how else would we provide any change through it and this is one of the few occasions in my life where i used gobos um, i don't really often use gobos i don't think they're very helpful in the main i think they're pretty hackneyed but in this environment with so little other rig so little ways of changing the space i felt that i would um i would go against my own um my own rule and uh, use a couple of gobos now here you can see channels 41 42 43 they're underneath that sort of walkway structure i was talking about and they are to shaft through those doorways that we were looking at so let's try and find uh, the relevant pick of that so you get oh there's a lovely picture the audience never saw this actually this is a photographer running around behind Alex Kingston and Ken Branner at the moment where that light is on the genie shafting through and he got this great shot in, oh. into the lamp. But anyway, that's not what the audience saw, so that's a fake. Um, yeah, so here, here are the doorways. And these doorways were just arch. They were just arch shaped to start with. And uh, they would shaft through all those holes in the planks or they would just shaft through the doorways. And then we came to, um, is this a dagger I see before me? And this was all down to the magician, the illusionist employed on the show. And the first one was going to be a fishing rod from the top of the walkway cover, someone hidden with a fishing rod and on the end of the fishing rod, a dangling dagger, like looking like this. But of course that person couldn't look over the parapet. They couldn't see what they were doing. They were very uncertain about what height, what angle, how far out from the, um, how far out from the uh, from that overhang they were, and so that that never appeared in the same place twice, and therefore it's impossible to you know the the, the point about the point about uh, um, anything on a fishing line is you need not to catch the fishing line, you just need to catch the thing underneath it, and if you know where that fishing line is, then you can do that. You can cut a really hard cut in, boom. In this environment where it's someone with a fishing line that sometimes is fishing rod that sometimes here and sometimes there, and you know I've got no chance, so it wasn't working. The second uh, was working. This is the second one. Now this was quite clever. They ran across in a scene change and this is stretched out with two uh, lines, one at the top going off in that direction in, in, each, in each side and one at the bottom in each side. And it was sitting on a grate and underneath that grate there was a park hand for another section of the show. And so it just suddenly hovered and it bounced very slightly because two people on the side suddenly pulled it and lifted it slightly. And it gently bounced in a way that felt like it was floating but also the audience is naturally looking you're always looking upwards you always assume that something's dangled from above not being pulled out that way and so that was being pulled out from the side and it sort of floated and it would be at that angle and the glow of the parkan parkan was at you know 15 percent, nothing more than that but against the metal the entire audience saw this glowing floating thing so that was a hit but we didn't have the first moment we didn't have the first is this stack right here before me and so we went home that night with everyone saying, oh, I need to figure out a way. And well, you know, the illusionist saying, well, lighting needs to not light the line. And me going, Dwight, how's that ever going to happen? Um, so as ever, as with most moments of inspiration, they, they always happen in the shower. You have a sleepless night and they either happen early in the morning when you're dreaming or in the shower. And in the shower, I suddenly thought, oh, ho, ho. what about those? VR 1000 arcs behind those doorways. So I came in and I said to Christopher, I, would you mind, we're in a church, so it seems like it fits with your design, but would you mind if I cut two crossbars off the slats so it makes those arches look like they're ecclesiastical, uh, um, th there's a small cross within them. And he said, well, why? I said, well, I'm gonna cut them at an angle with the jigsaw at an angle. And so they're gonna be at the right angle for the light to be able to shaft through. Please trust me. So then I have to also ask the, the carpenters, this is one thing I'd quite like to do myself. Please let me. Wouldn't have been able to happen in America. Here it did. Um, so I cut the holes in, oh God, here we go. I cut the holes and you see, you can see it here. You see that cross hole there? Mm -hmm. The rest of the time, it just looks like, yeah, we're in a church, it's supposed to be a church, and there's a little bit of an ecclesiastical thing. But come that moment, this lamp, the VR1000, 
the shutters move in and in and in and in until it's just lighting, just backlighting this one strip. And the top and bottom shutters come in as well. And so the first moment that Macbeth says, is this a dagger I see before me? That was the image. And there is, it's hilt towards my hand on the floor. So it was all done about this shaft of light on the floor that all the audience could see because they were high. There's no one in the stall, so everyone's looking at the floor. And Ken absolutely reacted to that, that light shaft on the floor. And by cutting these, uh, by cutting those at an angle to the light, that meant that I absolutely got these, what is that? Is that scabbard? Who knows about, who knows? Someone must know about swords and shit like that. What's that bit called on the sword? Anyway, this is the hilt, isn't it? And that's the something or other. The bit that protects your fingers, stops you cutting off your own fingers. Anyway, there you are. That was it. And that became the most talked about thing on that show. And that was absolutely something that was created at the last minute in the moment of complete need. And it was a, one of those moments of, of inspiration. So there you are. Yeah, I think that's incredible as an as a, um, idea. Yes, it proved really hard to repeat when we went to America and we did the same show in the armory. It was really hard to figure out how it had worked, but it was a really happy, beautiful accident. And that's what it looked like. So there you are. Never be scared of cutting a hole in a set. Yeah, gosh. I mean, one of the things I noticed, um, or one of the things I was going to ask you about was uh, when you're dealing with tricky limitations like this. Um, oh, then... One of the tricky limitations of this, by the way, why the rig's so small is we were all on generator power. Ah, okay. So that's why it had to be so little. It had to run on one, one generator. So I also had to be very careful about how I was lighting the show. Anyway, sorry, carry on. carry on. No, you're fine. Actually, there's a question. I don't know if you've seen this. Joseph was saying, is it a nightmare Ooh, to be in presumably a, a listed building? Yes, it is. Uh, sorry, I, so I can't see the chat when I show no, the screen. No, 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 no. So yes, um, listed building. Um, yes, but thank God that's up to the production manager to negotiate. I mean, yeah, you can't, we couldn't drill into it. So actually, in all of that stuff, that's why it's acro props out into bits of wood into the arch because that's why the bar behind the capital of each pillar was actually just ratchet strapped on all done by rigging company all all okayed but you know nothing making any permanent damage to the building yeah yeah i mean you've done loads of uh things where you need to you know fit light through windows and and um, you never have enough space and stuff um i'm thinking particularly of somewhere like the donmar um how do you approach that when you need to get light through a window but you don't have the space how do you have that conversation? yeah i mean well it's quite interesting isn't it uh, uh, the when i was at guildhall let's unshare this for a minute when i was at guildhall the uh i let only one show when i was there because that, that was the first year that they really or the first time that they allowed any students to light shows and i lit one show in the studio and there was this beautiful arched window for this thing called the workshop it was all about women in a french workshop during the wartime making clothes and it had one, it was an entire female cast, uh, except for one young man uh, who uh, I should, somewhere there's a program, somewhere, somewhere in the shelves above me, there's a program. And that young, uh, that young man was played by someone called Ewan, um, mm -hmm. uh, Mc, uh, Mc, yeah, Mc, I don't know what happened to him, McGregor, something like that, yeah. Anyway. But that window had uh, probably, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm trying to remember it now, but I, I, it was really no more than, no more than half a meter, maybe 60, 60 centimeters at most. Not enough to get anything behind. And I was obsessed, even then, I see, with getting light from without. I hated faint. This is why one of the reasons I hate goers. I see a lot of shows still that there's a set on this, especially maybe in Over the Water with our North American cousins. But um, there, there might be a window in the set, but they make a gobo of that window and then do it from a viper in front instead. Yeah. Now there may be many, many reasons why you can't get light behind there, especially on a musical where there are so there's so much up in the rig and there might not be any space. But I would always rather, if possible, use light from without a space to light it. I mm -hmm. think light from off, light from elsewhere is what makes the architecture work. Um, 
Yes. What were we talking about? I can't. We're talking about getting light through a window. Um, oh when... yes. Yeah. So so there in the workshop. So that so that was a very early case of me. Um, uh, I now realised you know doing a whole thing, and I wanted the sun. I wanted you to be able to see against the backdrop behind that sun streaking across it, sun coming in through the windows. So there was a bugger load. I rigged pattern 23s. Yes, I'm that old, sort of. All the way up in a tiny little uh, boom up the yeah. sides in different colours so that we could have, you know, uh, a shaft that came across absolutely at sunset or a slightly higher and there, all the way around. So there was light in the backdrop. And then also I needed to get light through the windows. And the way of getting light through the windows, I wanted soft daylight coming through the windows. And I couldn't fit enough park hands behind there. And so what I did was I got a piece of hardboard and I put that, you know, that thing at the back of the, um, that thing at the back of the Lee swatch book, this, this stuff that you go, whoever uses that, whoever yeah. uses this stuff. I tell you, I did once and uh, actually more than once because I've used it a couple of times since, but I covered this piece of hardboard with that, stapled it all in. And then I rigged the hardboard above and behind the windows out of the audience's um, sight line and I curved it and I put a bow into it like that. And then in the place where there was space above the window downstage pointing upstage into this curved reflector, I rigged bugger loads of park hands and redheads nice. and anything I could find that was small enough. And so you got this extraordinary sense of soft daylight from outside. So that's that's one of the ways of doing it. We did it at the Doma. I, I'll share my screen uh, for a different show. Da, 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 da. So, uh, oh. God, oh, something's going horribly wrong. Uh, here we are, After Miss Judy. Lovely play, uh, Patrick Marvel was supposed to be writing a new play for the Donmar. This is a long time ago, this is before any of you were born. Uh, but this is the Donmar House, a beautiful space. I don't know whether you know it, this gives a bit of a sense of the space. So there are red seats, not black like this, on three sides. So that's auditorium uh, right. This is the main section of the front auditorium. And then underneath the image here, there's a similar section to over this. And then there's the balcony up here. Audience wrapping around on three sides. This is an extraordinary stage. This is the perfect thrust stage and the perfect size of theatre. Weirdly, from here to the other side of stage over here, that is the same as pretty much the same as the proscenium width of most West End playhouses. And yet it feels so different. You're so intimate to it. it makes transferring shows from here very easy. Uh, also, this stage works perfectly because the the section of thrust and the vom angle are perfectly designed, presumably by accident, but it just happens to be that if you stand at the confluence of that vom and that vom, you're here. And if you're there, you can stand and you've got all the audience in your peripheral vision. You can see you're just, there's the last person there and the last person up here. So out of your peripheral vision, you can just see everybody. So you turn your head and you've got the entire audience all the way yeah. around. The reason none of the thrusts work at the Royal Shakespeare Company is they're too long and too thin with the VOMs at 45 degrees at the end. So the VOM still comes in at this angle, and yet this is th twice or three times the length. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there's nowhere to stand. So if you've got the point being, sorry, I didn't quite explain that properly. Whilst I'm here as the protagonist, Anyone else I'm talking to can be here in the VOM and every member of the audience can see around them and see the protagonist. No one is blocked from that sightline. So you can do exceptionally important speeches. You can make sure that the other people have blocked themselves out to here and the same the other side. So you can have more than one person on stage and the whole audience see past to that. The RSC doesn't work because it's too long. So you either have the, you either are in the right position for the VOMs, but then you've got most of the audience behind you on each side, or you're in the right position for that, and yet you can't have someone in the VOMs because people are look, trying to look through their legs and through their bodies to see the person. Anyway, they are. That's a, a, a minor point about the Doma, why, why it's rather lovely. So this is, here we are, the same thing again, load of windows. How on earth are we gonna get through those? Because actually the reality of the space behind those windows, no, I don't wanna back that up, uh, is, Oh, let me see, it's not a great drawing, but there's tiny, and I wanted to fit six par cans and two, oh, look, I'm using a gobo way back then, how naive, um, uh, and, and, and two source horse behind that. And eventually I had to go up with my friend, because one of my old friends from college was the chief electrician there at this stage, we went up together and we 
packed them in as tightly as possible. They kept saying, can't be done, can't be done, can't be done. But eventually we did it. We did, you know, one steep going to the bottom of the window and one shallower mm. right up against the brick wall coming through. And it gave you this kind of feeling in the show, these great big, so all of that light on Richard Coyle there and Kelly Riley, all of that rim, that halo light, everything hitting her here, that is absolutely coming through those windows. That's not faked from in front. It is coming from without. Yeah. And that becomes very important when you're trying to tell the story of one space and different times. So that at night time, oh well, look, there they are. Look, you can see the go both. God, I beg your pardon. You see, <laughs> I'm just a hypocrite. Anyway, so there's you know, a little dapple of, I don't know, moonlight or something outside. But now that now the now this set has gone from being high and daylighty and big and cavernous to being quite intimate and small and low as because now it's lit by this low stuff and, and this great big shaft. Again, look, a shaft from without. This shaft coming in through there, this shaft coming in through the doorway. In fact, that shaft then got used later on. There's a moment where she, oops, oh my God, she witnesses this is uh, Helen Baxendale. Um, uh, she hears noises off and she realizes that her husband is um, in flagrante with uh, Miss Julie off and she sits there and we watch her face as she realizes what's going on and the betrayal mm. and um, that moment the director wanted her to be sitting here again and this is the first this is the second time I worked with Michael Grandage not uh, and and I said to him well look she's just come in because of something she's forgotten in the sort of office area that you can't you can see the telephone over there it's not the kind of occasion that you necessarily would want to turn on the lights because he wanted to come in and turn on the lights and then sit here and realize I said no 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 let's not do that let's have her like you would you know you go for a pee in the bathroom at night and you don't necessarily turn, turn on the light do you? You, yeah. you you use the light from the hall um oh sorry that was very base but there you are so I said <laughs> let's do it there she walks in she walks down this shaft of light and she, she goes to the office and instead of coming around the front of the table we see her upstage the table the entire time. Michael was worried that that would cut her off at the waist too much, but it became this extraordinarily beautiful image because she's there, she hears the noise, she wanders back from the office and she stands here in this shaft of light and looks off and it was, yeah. Mm. So, yeah. there you are. So light from without, light from within, uh, naturalistic lighting, there you are. And things are not always naturalistic. Shall, shall I just do some other bits and pieces? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Go for um, it. So that is a play, naturalistic. We've done a play in a weird environment. Let's do play abstract. So one always thinks of musicals being colour. I would like to bring you to a play with huge amounts of colour. This is a, um, this is the set here. Uh, this is the treatment. So it's a Martin Crimped crimp play, a very early play uh, from the Royal Court, uh, which we revived at the Almeida. And the idea was, um, well, the, the play is deeply surreal and odd and quite discombobulating to watch. And we decided that it would be a gray environment. It's looking slightly pink in this photograph. I'm afraid that's just the iPhone doing that. But it was going to be, look, and there again, people are obsessed with this five-sided bloody box in a small, aperture so you can see the the almeida normally this space up here you would light from that's a normal side lighting position on stage all blocked up you can see the, the sort of balconies and a very low aperture because we needed the um uh needed there to be a, a, a wiping uh front cloth and there's obviously no flying at the almeida it's a small theater i don't know if you know it but it's it's um you can have a look online it's a beautiful it's an old um uh it's an old operating theater in the old-fashioned uh, sense of the word and they exhumed bodies uh, Egyptian mummy bodies there as well the um, Islington Egyptian Society uh, were there and so sort of it was audience uh, quite a way around looking down into the central pit where the operating would be going on um, so gray environment so I could mute it could be mutable I could turn it any color I wanted but there's a ceiling obviously very little light from the Almeida. You can't get much light in from the rig up here because it's just going to take a shadow and probably going to end up doing that. I can show you on the plan. Let me find the plan. Is it this one or is it the other? I had to open them in two different versions of Vectorworks because it wouldn't let me open enough. Here are the treatments. 
uh, what should we do? What should we do? What should we do? So there's the front. There's the front elevation. You can see that that aperture is very low compared to where the rig would normally be, which is on that pipe there. And in terms of section, somewhere there's a section here. Oh, there it is. Uh, oh, wow, okay. Back to this. Ah, oh, stop it. Um, hi, can you all see that? So you can see the problem. Yeah. The aperture is down really low. You don't have much sight line into it. Um, so you've, I've got to A, drop some stuff down to see in, but it's going to be very flat, everything for the front. So the first thing I said to the designer who was Giles Cadle is I'm going to need an aperture at the front. Um, so the first thing we negotiated actually was that this and this changed height slightly because at the moment, as you see in the original drawings, that being so high compared to the height of the ceiling down low here meant that this would see almost this to be out of sight would see almost nothing. Yeah. So I did actually persuade him to bring the front, uh, I think take the ceiling up slightly and bring the front aperture down slightly, all around the sight line from the back row. You can see there's a problem about what the back row can see. But I said, well, look, the back row needs, needs to see that person. So already we can bring this down by a foot. Mm -hmm. And if we take this up by six inches, then suddenly these lights are have a much better view. They can now yeah. see much better. So that was the first set of negotiations that went on. Uh, get that aperture in there. And then I started like a very small aperture at the back. And this was just after Potter, just after I'd worked very hard with GLP on the X4 bars. I'd seen the X4 bars at Plaza, they sh um, and I knew Mark Ravenhill from years ago when he used to work at Martin. And I said, oh, this is quite an interesting unit. Uh, this would probably be 2015. And I said, I've got Harry Potter coming up. And I think I could spec an awful lot of these, you know, probably 200 of them. But uh, having borrowed one, I said, um, you've got the wrong source in them. It dims like a piece of shit. It's got terrible chromatic, aber chromatic aberration at its smallest, uh, smallest size. And you've only got one axis of movement and you do it really jerkily. He sort of wrote back jokingly going, okay, so you're basically saying you like the light, but you hate everything about it. And we've got <laughs> six months to sort this out. I said, yeah, we've got six months. Will you work with me on it? And we worked hard and a couple of trips back and forth to Germany and then keep sending software updates. And eventually we got the dimming to be brilliant. Uh, the source, there is now a theater source version, an RGBA source rather than RGB white source. The amber massively helps in theater because you can mix much better warm colors. Otherwise you're, you're reliant only on red and green to mix any form of warm. Um, and that becomes, there's something about the eye that can see that. I can see that on hair. I can tell when it's done with just red and green, when it's an orange made with red and green. Yeah. They're so far apart in the spectrum that I can absolutely see it. So having the amber in there really helps you make a more full spectrum version of those oranges or those warms, and obviously makes them brighter as well. So. So that was there. Uh, anyway, so I knew about the the um, X4 bars and I said, well, we don't need much of a slot in the back. And I figured that if I rig them as far back as possible, interrupting their calibration, as you can see there, their calibration is going through the wall, mm. uh, that they would see as much as possible and there'd be amazing backlights that they could use as specials or I could use as flooding backlights. I also secretly knew that if it was that big, I could fit in some Source 4 90s and, uh, that the Almeida have and to get some other white back right. In order to do this, I had to go back to GLP, having only just done Potter and say to them, now I need you to give me a version of those lights where the software doesn't need them to calibrate. And there is a version kicking around in there, which is quite dangerous to use, especially this way around, but where uh, they don't need to do full calibration and they assume they are where they left them. If someone has knocked them in between, you're buggered. But if someone hasn't knocked them in between, they, they carry on as they were when they were last switched off. That meant that I could rig this as far back as possible, get the best possible shot through there. Now, what that all ended up in is a show that was, I wanted to be um, monochromatic, deep hued, deep saturation colors. Mm. And so this is the very first scene. And you can see there, these are a couple of source force specials coming from that aperture at the back there. So in order to stop reflection back, we've covered the back of this upstand, um, this upstand here, we've covered with black surge. So there's no reflection back, giving us nasty things on the back wall. There's also right there, 
where my cursor is now, there was a, at 45 degrees, uh, a couple of runs of LED tape. That's why the back wall is looking nice and glowy. Uh, there was also some of that tape back at the front on this bit, which is obviously a bit lower in the reality. So there were, there were ways of providing solid color in there. There were also lots of uh, lusters. Now they are made as a delightful place to work since they got some money from the uh, lottery a few years ago to buy 100 lusters. It's mm. amazing. It's brilliant. The only trouble is when you try and transfer a show out of there, you can't afford the lusters on your rental budget in the West End. But anyway, for, the, for this show, so there we are. We've got this deep, deep monochromatic hued deep blue. These are, I took these, so these are, um, I've made sure that these are the correct color. Next scene, boom, we are. So the whole thing is unnaturalistically lit. Still dynamic. As you can see here, those X bars are giving us this, you can see the multiple shadows down here in this image. Yeah. I wonder if that's big enough for you all, but can you see it there? Yeah, yeah. The, that's the X bar giving this strong green haloed backlight. So we're not, we're not lighting it differently in terms of uh, the dynamic possible shafts from without again coming through the doors. It's just that they're all in really odd, discombobulating, saturated hues. A restaurant you go to. Here you can see those, those X bars. They were X bar 10s, nice short ones and in pixel mode. So I could pick a pixel in this unit that just top lit that flower. And yeah. I could pick with these three units here, this one's, this one's panned further upstage to backlight her very tightly with the, this one and that one are panned further downstage. And you can see this tight backlight they do on them. And the whole show is, yeah, deep, deep, weird, wonderful, odd colors. You know, this is supposed to be a subway scene. And so we took the cue from the yellow of the subway uh, girders. Anyone who's been to New York, you know, when you're down in the subway, it is uh, absolutely bright yellow metalwork like this. But the mm. whole scene was therefore lit like that. And there was a grate at the front that I asked to get put in for this scene so that A, we could do a ripple of a train across it, but B, I could light the entire scene with up light because why not uh, yeah. at this moment? So. And there's that same environment that you saw earlier. There's a later scene, and the second time you come around to it, it's entirely different. Yeah. Um, blah, blah, blah. And then there's a final, oh, actually, we don't have the final photograph, but anyway. But there you are. So there's, there's, there is a play lit in a completely unnaturalistic way. How, um, you say that you, you knew you wanted to do it sort of chromatically, but I mean, how much did you, you know, with LED now, we're getting to the point that the color decision gets later and later and later. Did you know the color each scene was going to be in advance? No, <laughs> no, I, 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 I said to Robin, who's the lovely uh, house electrician at the Almeida, um, I sat him to my left so I could have the, the twiddly knobs uh, near me and I'd say, right, give me control of HSI. And I'd be like, oh, that's nice, we'll have that. <laughs> no. I, had a vague, I had a vague idea of what I thought because sometimes you were taking cues from other elements in the scene, but a lot of the time, the, these weren't based on it's one of the few times that I use lusters and it's not based on gel color. One of the great things about using a luster through an EOS desk is they are calibrated. So if you run them in HSIC plus seven mode or HSIC would do you, uh, HSIC means that it's hue, saturation, and intensity calibrated. And that means at the factory, this is a rather extraordinary machine in Middleton, Wisconsin, where they plug the back end of every manufactured luster in and into a chromatograph, I don't know, or something or other, this bloody clever piece of machinery. But basically then into the chip in the back of that luster tells it you're a bit deficient in the cyan, but you're quite efficient in the deep blue. And therefore, when you run in calibrated mode, the desk is not sending DMX data about what that color is. The desk is sending to the light a specific HSI value that the light knows how to auto-correct itself. So if you look into all the different lights running in HSIC mode, what you'll see is uh, if you take out the, the homogenizer gel and where you can see all the different smarty colors within them, the seven different colors, you'll see that they're making them up in slightly different proportions. Each mm -hmm. lamp is doing a metama of that color, a slightly different variation. So if it is, for instance, in this scene, it's amber is not so good or whatever it is. It's, uh, sorry, it's orange red is not so good. It's pushing a bit more red in, in yeah. one year to make up for it. 
So that on a white surface, if you were to look at all those lamps side by side, they would appear to be the same color, but slightly different brightnesses if you were very perceptive. Mm -hmm. And that's because each one knows. Whereas if you just ran them direct with desk data, you would see all of those deficiencies like you do in every other LED unit. So that you'll find that one looks slightly greener than the other because it's green is slightly more efficient or not working yeah. quite the same as the others. So HSIC mode, I heartily recommend it. I also recommend it because it stops you having seven knobs to twiddle for the seven different colors. Mm. I don't know if to make the color I want, I need to be taking out the cyan and adding a bit of the medium blue instead, or should I be adding a bit? God knows, God knows, it's too much. And I certainly can't communicate that, especially in America where I can't touch the desk. I can't communicate that to somebody else. I either need to rely on their eyes, or we need to work in a way where you can talk about hue and saturation. Yeah. Like, That's the right kind of hue, just give me more or less saturation. Uh, yeah. Okay, now back on the hue, let's just very slightly make it redder. It's, these are much easier ways of talking about color. Yeah, definitely. The other great thing about the calibrator mode is the desk knows gel color. So I can say Roscoe 316 and boom, up will come this beautifully ambery gold that the desk and those lights know what it is and it comes up with it. So I don't need to do a color library myself necessarily. So. Mm -hmm. But in this case, making it up as you go along, trying to make the weirdest, wonderful, most sickly, odd colors that you can. So there you are, a play that is not naturalistic. Brilliant. Neil, do you think with the, the rise of kind of um, more interesting lighting in things like um, Netflix, things like Ratchet and Stranger Things and all of those um, kind of uh, TV programs where the lighting is slightly veering more on the unnaturalistic is making audiences more susceptible to, to ideas like this? It's interesting. You have, what you are noticing is, and you, you're, you're putting your finger on there, is a change. The film and television world have for years reveled in naturalism. And that was for many reasons. The fact it was how they tell stories is naturalistic in, in general. Um, but it was also about film stock and early digital sensors about what they were balanced for. As those sensors have got better and better and better, the ability to use deep hues has improved. Plus there has been the increase in the role of someone called a colorist and you'll see it in the credits at the end. And so actually a lot of the time when they shoot it, it doesn't look like, um, what was the program we were talking about earlier? Uh, the thing that we've just been watching with you, Laurie. Um, Roadkill. Oh yes, Roadkill. Yes, quite quite a good David Hare thing. Um, but yeah, there, there there are some deep deep ambers and some very odd colours, a bit like this in contrast to the ambers. So they're sort of using that and that in combination in the scene. And I don't think they looked necessarily that deep to start with. There are clues in how it's filmed about the fact that it probably wasn't that deep, and that's probably the colourist. Ratcheting up, ratcheting up the saturation like you can in Photoshop. But yes, that now means, now that film and television are getting braver, certainly we might hear. But there are times where you want it to be naturalistic and not discombobulating. And there are times where you want to upset the audience. You know, with a great emotional uh, manipulators lighting, we hold the key to the audience's subliminal reaction to a scene. You don't want to preempt those moments. You don't want to change from a warm environment and do that slow, at its most basic, you don't want to change from open white to 201 at the wrong moment in the script. You will preempt the audience's reaction. But if you time that long, slow fade perfectly, by the time the audience are feeling upset and, um, and shocked by the information they're hearing, you've arrived there and they haven't noticed. This is a really good, uh, there's a really good um, film that I always use as a, as an example of bad teamwork. So when you work well, the actors, the writer, the director, the costume designer, the sound designer, the lighting designer are all working on the same script to, to display the same emotional moments, the same story points at the same time. And that, what I, that example I just gave about changing, changing the atmosphere of, uh, from warm to cold can be hugely effective when done correctly. But 
as an example of a moment where it doesn't work, there's a film called um, Life is Beautiful that won Best Foreign Oscar back in, I think, 1998 or 1999, actually. And um, Italian film, quite interesting. It's very much a film of two halves. The first half is the young boy growing up uh, 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 in, in Italy. Second half is concentration camp and the father. And it, I, I find it, it is, it's actually a deeply offensive film within it at the time. I couldn't believe that it was winning Best Foreign Oscar because I felt it was making uh, light of the concentration camps because what the father is trying to do is he's trying to make the entire thing into a game so the son doesn't realize where he is um, but in doing that I felt it was done with quite a heavy hand anyway it's a film of two halves and you don't know about the concentration camp coming so the scene where the father arrives home on the bicycle dumps the bicycle outside the Italian uh, uh, house walks inside something slightly odd there's a, a tipped over chair but it doesn't you know da, da, da. walks into the kitchen calls to his wife calls again then shot of husband's face that's the moment the audience realized that's the moment the audience cotton on something shit has gone on and the husband's realized it and it's really bad what is it so the key turning point in that scene is the cut to shot of face instead of which Jolly little tune as you watch him cycling up the lane and into the drive, which suddenly, as you get to the shot of him coming around the house to put his bike at the side of the wall, turns into a cello doing, you know, so the composer has preempted by about four edits the moment and has told the audience too early, you should be scared. Mm. And it's absolutely the wrong thing to do because the audience and the character don't discover at the same time. And in that film, it's important that they discover at the same time. There's nothing that should be telling the audience to worry before the character tells you they're worried. There are moments, obviously, where you do choose as a filmmaker or a theatre uh, person to allow the audience to be ahead. But that was a really, really bad piece of piece of composition. And you could see that in terms of uh, film angle and everything else, you know, what the camera, did, what the director of photography was doing wasn't odd until the shot at the face, which, you know, was from a different angle. And yet the composer preempted it by four or five edits. So it's important. You're part of a team. You're not a solo artist. You are a collaborator. Yeah, definitely. Um, there you are. That's a, so there you are. Uh, hey, how about musical without color? So we've done play with colour, now we do musical without colour. This is Evita on Broadway. I didn't do it in London, I did it on um, Broadway. Uh, somewhere I've got the plan, it's absolutely bloody huge. It's hilarious, you'll love it. Well, uh, you're finding this, I'm gonna ask you, do you draw your own plans? Yes, I do. Although I've become lazy just recently on, on Frozen coming to London uh, because I got a lovely American associate and she's drawing the plans. <laughs> I normally get a bit annoyed. So I, yes, this plan I drew for, there you are. Boom. Is that clear to all of you? Yeah, yeah. Bloody massive. There's a Broadway musical for you. Um, yeah, I drew this myself and figured it all out and then got slightly annoyed when my American associate then redrew it again. And he was like, no one over here is going to understand what the hell this means. But I like my, I like my drawings to look like this. This came from imagination, actually. This came because I was drawing the Millennium Dome and we were dealing with 1 to 250 rather than 1 to 25. Okay. And when you're drawing on an AO plan, birdies at 1 to 250, you can't see them. Yeah. And luckily it was the beginning of colour printing. So I started to put my symbols in red. Okay. Uh, and because, sorry, I'll show you what it looks like with the... Um... Oh, dear me. So that's what I, I look at and I find it very clear. Predominant bits of set in blue, flying yeah. pieces or temporary bits of set underneath. I always want my plan to have the set underneath it. Some people would much rather their plan look like that. I don't, I want to know. I want to know where all that set is because there are critical moments where I'm looking at the plan as my sole piece of information. An American is looking at their plan. They, they, they hardly ever look at their plan. In fact, the first time I went to America and did a show, I took the plan out and stood at the stage looking up and they were all like, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? No one gets the plan out unless something's wrong. Everyone uses light right. So right. like I want to know, I want to know at the time that that piece of scenery flies in or that person standing somewhere that I can identify 
that I can identify from my plan where they are on the floor and why I can't get to them with the light that I'm trying to get to them with. What is it that's in the way? Where are they standing? Oh, I see they're by that pillar. So actually, yes, they're upstage of Electrics 3. That's why I can't backlight them with Electrics 3. So all of that information is on there for me. So. And you, you use quite specific symbols, don't you? Am I wrong in thinking that? Yes, yeah, I do. They're, I've drawn them all myself over the years. I've got a huge... Uh, let's see. Because they're exactly the, the right... Side. Yeah, so I hate... I, I grew up in, uh, I'm old. Uh, I grew up with uh, Richard Pilbrow's glorious one to 25 scale symbols and stencils. Mm -hmm. And they were wonderful because on a scale plan with a pen, as you drew, you knew if that lamp would fit or not. If you drew it at the angle it was drawn at and then you drew the other lamp and you realized they were clashing and their noses were hitting, you knew that you needed to leave more space between them. And I want to know that information in advance. So here you are. So here are all my, over the years, I have, and this won't even be the rest of them because this is a plan from 2013, but they are, there's a whole load there and there's, a, there's more of them than, um, mm. than that. Uh, yes, I need to know because, sorry, let me just go back to the other view because it's easier. Are you all right for time, by the way? I don't want to keep you here. Oh, I'm fine. Yes, sorry. Am I boring everyone else? I beg your pardon. No, you're not at all. I just have questions. So that's, I wanted to change yes, it up. Sure, very quickly. Oh God, I need to move this. How do I move this? And then... <laughs> it's in the way. I'm going to have to do this. I need to do this to yeah, show you the section. There's the section. This is why it's really important for me to know that my symbols are scale. Yeah. Because I find out from the electrician how they are planning on rigging. And in this case, it was American gas pipe and a C clamp. Mm -hmm. So I know that this will fit. I know that on the plan where it tells you what the spacing is between this and this, I know that when Kevin, my lovely production electrician in America, gets someone to put them at that height, that will work. That yeah. will fit. There will not be a moment of them going, ah, you've got six source fours up there and I can only fit five. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to figure out why. I have done all that work in advance. I know that. Eee. That this revolution is rigged as low as it possibly can do to calibrate yeah. and it doesn't have a top hat on it. I know that they fit and this one does as well. That's all done in advance. That's what my world is. Oh, look, you see this poor approach electrician I'm working with. Imagine 21 pitching digital light curtains. I don't know if you remember those. Those are the precursor to the X, X4 bar. They were eight par 56s in a row. Yeah. with a huge scroller in front of them. Imagine how big that scroller needed to be. And then on top of that, not only did they do this, but they also pitch. And then I rig them above a permanent piece of set where the bars can't fly in. <laughs> so I figured out that if you put a focus bridge on either side, you could lift the bars up. And so poor Kevin and his electricians used to have to get a digital light curtain from the fly floor height here, up a ladder at the end, shuffle it along the focus bridge <laughs> and lift it over. He still works with me, but he does remind me that I'm an asshole on very frequent occasions. So there you are. So really important to draw good sections because you know that works. There's no time, especially in commercial theater, especially in American theater, my God. Your electricians are getting paid 50, 60 or $70 an hour. Mm. And then overtime for the evening on top of that hourly rate. You have to know. Now, look, uh, we were going to look at this. Let me show you the photographs from this, but we'll come back to America and difficult rigging. So here you are. So light from without or light from within. Um, I don't have many photographs of this, but that's the set. This is, don't cry for me, Argentina. This is actually the tour, not the, not. And an early discussion with the producer went along the lines of, why are you not lighting the people below? And I said, well, I am. Well, I can't see them. I'm like, well, you can see their silhouettes and they're facing upstage. And they are the representing the homogenous crowd of the descamisados, the shirtless ones, who are adoring her. The focus is her. They're lit by her halo. All this light from within here that's pretending to be from this chandelier that you can just see. Mm -hmm. here. There you are. You can see the chandelier there. This is the moment, mo a moment before. But then as she sings, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And actually, there are six... Source four pars chosen because, of course, there's less distance from the lens to the nose. Mm -hmm. So I can get them closer to the angle of the audience, get them to come further downstage. And all these people are lit by that. 
uh, yeah, so there you are. So that's, you know, that's uh, light, light from without or light from within, make, make the uh, environment. Obviously very naturalistic. This was all lit with sort of candlelight through to, to double daylight. It was all lit with the equivalent of sort of, I don't know, GAM 3, Roscoe 09 through to, through to 201, essentially, sort mm -hmm. of fair idea. Transform that same space. This is the same space. This is that same environment trying to be somewhere different now. Well, you light through a different section of the windows differently, and it becomes it's now the ballroom. Some doors are closed down here. It's different. Um, yeah, and then you know, change change the height. Where is the light from without here? It's coming from inside again. Why can't I see the other soldiers? You don't need to see the other soldiers. It is all about this man who has arrived. That basically there is a military junta being imposed as part of the Peronist um, takeover of power, and it's the sinister nature of that military takeover and everything that meant because you know, any, any one Argentinian will know that that results in in the 1980s in a huge disappearance of mm -hmm. uh, uh, of generations of uh, socialist communists or any, anyone who opposed the government they were put by these people into planes and dropped into the river plate whilst drugged and drowned that's that's how most people were thought to have died they just would push them out of the plane into into the estuary. Uh, but yeah, so it's more effective not to see them. They are a shadowy, unknown, threatening presence. And the lower the angle of that backlight and the longer the shadow, the more that emotional truth is translated to the audience. There you are. Um, so there's the musical without colour. At some point we should do with company, which is a musical with colour. I can show you a few of that now. Look, company, here we are. Company, Bunny Christie. Let's make everything as difficult as possible. Let's put the band above the stage. I'm, I fought for enough space for an electrics one. I got 700 mil from, <laughs> the back, from the back of the iron to the front of that band platform and could fit one electrics bar in there. And then there was a bit of a gap behind it as well. But essentially then there was a great big bridge in the way. I needed to find a way of lighting so what I decided again, thank God, the X-bar had been invented. So underneath here were two huge long runs of X-bars. It made the bridge terribly un, um, terribly wobbly because it meant that there could be no up and down bracing, but we got around that in other ways. But it then meant that even if someone was underneath, I could just about like them. Uh, and then everything underneath there is in boxes. So when it's an open stage, it's a nightmare because the band are there. When it's not, it's even more of a nightmare because everyone's now in a five-sided box. So the negotiation with Bunny were, were, there were three negotiations with Bunny, which was just behind this face, there should be a small aperture enough, big enough for birdies, which in America became more x bars because we had a bit more money. Upstage, exactly what I talked about earlier, an upstage trough, just x bars this time, no source fours because nothing else could fit underneath here. This is only just clear, just out of sight line and uh, able to shaft back in there. But on top of that, I said, Everything else is going to come from without the box. And if you're making those boxes gray, which she was planning on doing, um, this face will be hot, will catch all the spill, even no matter how carefully I cut, I'm going to need to cut as close as possible to that. And yet all the flare will hit that and they'll look horrible. So let's make these light up. Yeah. And that was a very early negotiation. That was, that was my input in there. And that was because I also knew as a musical, we would want to, there's another bit of the set, bigger boxes, that we'd want to sometimes be in the same color world as the box. So blue and darker blue, you know, same sort of uh, hue, different saturation. Well, here you are, look, she's being backlit at the moment by those X-bars at the back that the audience can't see, but there's that tight bat light making Rosie's hair look gorgeous. Um, but then when you get to a musical number, boom. Now I've got color contrast, yeah. which is what, one of the keys of musicals and that's why i fought hard as nails even when the budget didn't really have the money for it to make sure that this existed because without that color contrast and all the light coming off coming from the front everything homogenizes into this color on the back wall and it becomes very difficult to separate colors yeah do the people with the press strings ever turn around to you then and go oh yeah no fair play that was that was yeah that was the one um I sold it to the production manager well enough and early enough in advance. And this is why it matters about when you come on board. If you come on late, then this stuff can't happen. But I was on early enough, just the moment Bunny showed this model, the same moment the production manager saw it for the first time, I said, the addition of cost that you need to take into account at this moment is. Because 
in saying yes to this set, they have to understand that there are there are massive knock-ons for you as a lighting designer. Because if they're only looking at the set and saying that's nice, oh, you're sorted out. Uh, they're not truly facing up to what they've said yes to. And I need them to say, I need them to. I, I need to have said all of this stuff in order to, you know, if they haven't given me all those lighting positions within the boxes that travel up and down with the boxes. So by the way, the boxes had a ton and a half of batteries on top of them as well, moving with them because these were wireless and battery controlled, mm -hmm. stepping up, stepping up to 240 volts to control the Xbox. But if that stuff wasn't there and they hadn't allowed me to do that, then at least when it's all lit from the front, from down low to get into the boxes and then they go, well, there are an awful lot of shadows on the back wall and they don't really seem to be pings very out. You can sort of say, um, do you remember the conversation about mm. it happened on a musical? I was given a musical with a bright yellow, mustard yellow set for the entire thing. And I said, that is the most unhelpful color. I actually got a, um, I got a, a chromatist. Uh, there is such a thing in America uh, to do a test on it for me with a luster. And he came back and you know how the luster's got the normal sort of uh, ring of, um, of color that it does. Mm. And it came back and it was like a tiny kidney bean shape that was sort of, uh, that was uh, yellow, green and red and no blue, no purple, no pink. And of course, looking at this image, you'll all remember that purple, <laughs> blue and pink are quite essential musical theatre colours. <laughs> the set you are giving me will not mutate. It is not mutable enough to create any of the standard colours. Anyway, first tech session, we sit there. And the director, who was a film director, was saying, right, show me this, show me that. So then, oh, I don't like the colour of the set. Turn it blue. And I said, okay, I'm going to show you what happens when I turn blue light onto this. And the set goes green. Yeah. She's like, turn it blue. And I'm like, I'm afraid we've had this conversation. Come over here and look. You do the hue on the wheel. You can turn it all the way around. We cannot make it. I warned you about this from the very start. The one thing this set will never, ever do is be blue or pink level. So uh, yes, so that's why you need to make your case early enough. Anyway, here I look, more photos. Oh, look, it's colorful, it's pink, it's like a musical, lots of LED. Oh, here you are, X bars at the top here. You can see that's underneath the band. And for this number at the top of that too, it's where everything's out of the box. They became very essential about how to light their people. Her in the box, blah, blah, blah. There you are, look, colour. Who, um, who decides on, this is a really geeky question, right, but see the perspex on the front. Do you have like a perspex grade that you go to over and over again? Or who decides on that? No, but I uh, test it with a, with a company because in fact, we had to cut budget wise. I These were very wide. These were about probably 20 centimetres wide, that front fascia. Yeah. And it was only, uh, two and a half inches deep. Okay. And that I would normally spec at uh, one and a half inch centers in order to not see it on, on the perspex. And we had to go for, which would have been three lines of tape. So I had to bias it towards the center. And you can see it a little bit in the pictures, especially down here. Do you see how it sort of dark at the edges? Oh, yeah. So I biased the tape close to the center because we couldn't afford the third stripe of tape. That was how we got around the budget. But it meant that it graded off towards the edges. But that was all the more important that it was a very good grade of perspex that was not going to show any of the sources through it because it was very tight to it really tight yeah and it couldn't be deeper because then it would screw up my position up here for the um uh for the birdies and it would screw up the doorways and da 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 da, da. anyway uh what are we gonna oh we could talk about huey quickly huey here we go this is why it's important to get <laughs> and there is christopher oram peering around the side of his set there look at him brilliant this is a piece forrest whitaker on broadway it is an hour long and it's Forrest coming back uh, uh, late at night, having been gambling and lost all of his money, talking to the night watchman who sits over here, who's so tired and he hardly says anything. And um, he, Forrest's character is telling him about his, the old night watchman who used to be his great mate, Huey. That's what the piece is about. That is the white card model. And you'll notice I'm not, standing off angle to take that photograph. That is absolutely skew. We are sitting dead center of the auditorium. And as you can see, there's a ceiling and another ceiling and great big pillars and a huge opaque window that at this point here is one foot away from the back wall of the actual theater. 
okay. to this point slightly further. No space here. This carries on up for another, probably about another five meters. So the person in the front row saw, the staircase wasn't practical after that, but um, saw an apparent staircase going up and up and up. It was an exquisite, beautiful set. So there's a bit of space over here to get in, but then again, this is getting in the way, and this is getting in the way, and there's a, well, there's space here around this clock on top. So I had to figure out how to light that, which was a nightmare. And here's the plan. Look at the plan. Everything is stage right. Huge booms yeah. in the wings. Only two overhead electric spars. One right up stage. That's high out of the audience's sight line. Right up high here to, to come down at that window as bright as possible. And one so immensely high here that we could just get to it from a genie there poking over the top of the five meters high there. We had to get the tallest possible genie. And even then it was pretty damn scary. And there we are. And then there's some stuff, there's some, it's all booms, as you can see. A really, really complicated set. You can see the front of the front of that window is this, wig, uh, front of the ceiling is that wiggly line mm. there. So there's no space. It's a theater that, uh, well, we couldn't afford an advanced trust, but I didn't really want an advanced trust either. So, and I was drawing this in a hurry as well, a bit of a nightmare doing too many shows. And so I figured it all out, but I just drew it as lusters mm. with some uh, revolutions, uh, thinking that by the time the rental company came back and said, we, you can't possibly afford lusters, that I would have had time to have a look at it and then make the cuts. Amazingly, the rental company actually gave me all lusters, which is the first show on Broadway lit uh, predominantly with uh, lusters. Yeah. Um, and what that, each of these has worked out and each of them had to be you can see here a little bit, you see I have actually drawn each boom actually as it's rigged and I moved them into the right place one by one and I've then drawn an individual section through the set at that angle to check that this, because these four lamps are all doing the same thing, they're all going through underneath that ceiling over to here, so this one is doing that, this one is doing that, so you might only get a foot's worth of light coming across the top of the um, uh, where the clock is but between them they make up a wash across the stage mm -hmm. it was all figured out and what Kevin Barry did say to me and he doesn't always remind everyone is we only move one lamp and we move that one lamp by two inches and that was his fault not mine he'd rigged it to the wrong height Brilliant. this worked and this focused first time but my god you need to do your maths on it Anyway, and the show looked well. I, one of the things I wanted, I chose the neon as well. The neon was amazing. I had this amazing meeting with the neon guy and said, I want the neon from, um, from Vertigo. I want that hotel. I want this hotel to be like that. Christopher Oren wanted red. I said, no, 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 Christopher. Red's too obvious. Red's too glitzy. Red's too glamorous. I said, this needs to be that. And at and this stage, uh, I know from a book up here, there were only three colors of neon. There was argon, there was neon, and there was this green. And luckily, the neon man was old enough to remember that this, so this is the exact hue that you see in Vertigo. And if Vertigo doesn't look like this on your television, your television is, um, is uh, skewing the color a little bit. So mm. this was that, so this was this, but this is an example how just to mimic that sign, you can see how many beams of light there are in order to look as though that sign is casting its, it's a light in the space. There are so few apertures, but I'm cutting down between these two columns, high, mid, low, up onto the ceiling as much as possible from downstage and upstage. And so through that tiny gap, which was about three feet, we managed to get this great big set of shadows mm. across the set. What that ends up looking like uh, when it's composed into an image is this sort of stuff. So. It's just gorgeous. And the, and the set was exquisitely beautiful. So there you are. Right, sorry, I've rambled on for way too long. I've got loads of other things to show you, but we'll do that another time. What else would you like to know? Uh, I was going to ask you You're about... still awake. <laughs> I'm stopping screen sharing and, oh, look, Matthew's asleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's still up. Um, assistants and associates, how often do you use them? What do you use them for? Uh, so in London, people don't pay for it unless it's a very, very big show. So I had one person with me on Harry Potter who was there to call follow spots. And there were four follow spotters using six spots. They moved places. 
Whenever you go to America, they pay for an assistant associate. Well, they pay for an associate no matter what, that's the union regulation. Um, and if you're a big show like Potter, you also have an assistant. So I have an assistant and there it was six of Father Spotters because of union rules on six spots. Um, so in London, for instance, company, I had no associate, I had no assistant. I drew the plan myself, I did it draw myself. It was just me, a production electrician and my programmer. And it was horrible and hard and difficult. Oh, John's gone to sleep now as well. Uh, oh, I know them. And, um, uh, and so, yes, I was very reliant on the fodder spotters keeping their own notes. I would tell them what to do, but I didn't have time to keep notes of it. So thank goodness they were very good and scribbled down some notes. Well, that's the problem, probably British, British theatre, I think. I think one of the things that if we were in our blue sky thinking about let's not work evenings and Saturday mornings or Saturdays at all, um, one of the other things I would say would be let's always make sure an associate is employed. Because one of the reasons the industry is so, um, one of the great ways of learning in this industry is as an assistant and associate. I spent the whole of 1997 being Mark Henderson's uh, assistant on the Old Vic season. Peter Hall did a season of theatre, which was seven different shows. They never closed. They did a show every night of the week and two matinees. And if you came to London, you could see seven different shows. It was amazing. It was daily repertoire. And we, were, we wouldn't close to put the next show on. We would rehearse it morning and afternoon, then do a changeover and put the show on in the evening. But that experience of being a young assistant and sitting in a theatre and listening to Peter Hall, John Gunter, Mark Henderson discuss and looking at how those collaborations went was fantastic because it meant that when I got a chance to do that stuff myself, it wasn't entirely a scary environment. I mean, massively scary from your own point of view, but at least you understood what was expected of you and how you should do. So I think associates would be a great thing to employ over here. It would be also a, a great way of making the industry more diverse because if we were able to uh, encourage people from school to come and sit next to us or colleges and start to offer uh, associateships in five years time, those people will be emerging yep. into the industry and will be very, very well equipped to do so. so I, would I would like to see uh, permanent associateships going on. I think I'd like to see that as a permanent role and I'd like to see the ALD and equity insist on it and producers have to do it because also it would provide a, it would provide a lot of work for a lot of people and a lot of security. It was so insecure the early part of this industry for me. Yeah and a better work life balance wouldn't it really? Well, uh, yes, only if we cancel evening tech sessions, because let's always face that after 9pm, nothing good gets done. Oh my God, look, by the way, the UK may work from 9 till 10pm. Don't forget, when I started, it was 9 till 11pm. And thank God, at some point, the EEC, late 90s, brought in the 11 hour overnight break rule. And that's why we only work 9am till 10pm now. Isn't that bloody wonderful? Well, go to America, you work 8am till midnight. Yeah, yeah. What that is you allowed. What would you put as a, if you were putting a job advert out then for an associate, what would the qualities be? Oh, hmm. Well, for an assistant, it would be easier because I would be willing to take someone on who was just enthusiastic and uh, liked the industry and liked the environment. And I would be willing to kind of train them up through that. Yeah. For an associate, I need that person to be shit hot at Vectorworks. Bloody hell, British colleges, stop sending students out into the world who call me up the day after they leave college and say, I'd like to work as your associate. I'm like, great. Do you have vector work skills? Oh, no, but I'm willing to learn. Mm -hmm. I'm still learning vector works now. Years in. Sorry, we broke up there. You didn't hear how many years in. Um, <laughs> you, you cannot learn it in it. one month, two months, six months. It is... If you are not doing a daily Vectorworks class at college for an hour every morning, forget it. Yeah. Um, so I need that because really the bit of the, where can that person massively help me? When I'm really busy, if I'm stupid enough to be back in my early career doing 24 shows a year, if there had been someone employed to help me, the thing that person could best have done is whilst I'm at the production desk lighting a show, they can start to be sorting out angles and bits of plans and they can you know in any break they can say oh look this is you know i can i can i can have said to them okay i want a oh let's be really boring and, and francis read about this but you know i want an area wash across the stage and i probably want it to be in you know uh three meter squares or two meter squares 
can you just figure out does that divide across the stage and how many units would I have to do and where should the bars be put? But they can start doing that on their own. That's something that I can hand to them. And they can just come back to me and go, well, look, here it is worked out as four areas. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's hard because that doesn't give us one in the center. So we should either go down to three because it's a narrow stage or we should go up to five. Let's do a version of both because the budget might not stretch to five. So let's go down to three areas. Da -da -da -da. You know, yeah. that's, that's where that person can be massively helpful to me because they need to be, an associate needs to be able to, associate's a terrible role. They need to be able to be me at all the moments where I'm not there. Mm -hmm. So often my associate in, in America, uh, I work with a couple of brilliant people over there. You know, over the years, you find the people who you like working with. That's the key to working anywhere, actually finding teams of people you like and love. Uh, but on company, I found somebody new. I, I, I knew I hadn't had an associate or assistant in London. So it's an opportunity. Here I am on Broadway being offered an assistant and an associate on a musical. And I don't actually really, apart from all the paperwork the Americans need produced, I don't really need them. So now I can take a chance. And so I made, so there I thought, well, this is A, I want my team to be uh, as female as possible because of the subject of the show matter, but also because there are not enough women in, in American theatres. They are a stage behind us in terms of who you see. They exist, but not necessarily in the full Broadway theatres. They exist in the Lort theatres on Broadway, which is um, a strange categorization that is up. For, it's a bit like the Almeida or the Don Mar. They're up for the Olivier's, but they're not counted as full West End or something like that. Yeah. Not, not quite the right analogy, but close to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I'd heard of a great assistant um, called Jess Kreger, and I interviewed her. She was smart as hell. And she thought I was interviewing her for assistant on company. And I said, I want to offer you your first associate role on Broadway. And she was a bit like shocked. I said, because I think you can do it. And on top of the fact, you know, by the way, I've already drawn the plans. So da, 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 da. But what I need you to be able to do is you're going to be focusing the show before me because I arrive direct off a plane from Germany for tech session one. So you need to do everything before mm. that for me. She was utterly brilliant. And as part of that, we looked for uh, a new assistant because I said, but part of your role then is I'm allowing you to be an associate and I'm you know, going to help you through that. And it's going to be fine. It doesn't matter, you know, but for both of us, it can, it can be a learning curve. But we need to teach a new assistant, someone who's never been an assistant before, someone who doesn't. And we found a fantastic young guy straight out of a, uh, of a college upstate um, uh, who'd never been an assistant at Broadway before. And we probably have waited quite a long time to get that assistant role. But we bumped him into it and he, he gave the most nervous Zoom interview I've ever seen. It was, I felt awful asking any question because he was just shaking with nerves about it. But underneath it all, you could see there was someone rather brilliant. Anyway, he arrived in the room and he was a glorious presence. And now, of course, everyone's calling me up going, who's that person you used? Apparently you found someone who, and yes, that he's now got work coming out of his ears. That's <laughs> so brilliant. It, the, the problem is he won't be available the next time I meet him, which is a great show. But you know, there's an opportunity. There's a moment of a, of, of a leg up for two people. You go, I could have just employed someone who'd been an associate a million times and someone who'd been an assistant a million times. Yeah. I want to break up Broadway slightly and say, okay, there are not enough women and there are not enough people of color in this industry. And I asked for help finding both and yeah. I got very little help on it. And I had to go out and do that research myself, but I found both people who were more than capable of being there and absolutely fucking deserved to be there. It's just people weren't looking in the right places for them. Yeah, absolutely. And we need to be careful about that as an industry as a whole. We are too lazy. We will look at, Gil, oh, Gilt or Lambda, Rada, uh, you know, Rose Bruford, um, and uh, uh, Mountview. Those aren't the only places. And there are yeah. people who are coming different routes, or maybe didn't even know those places existed when they applied to university, or maybe they didn't even think they could go to university, but they're interested enough and they, they can have roles in the, in the industry. Anyway. We are sort of coming towards a bit of a natural end, but I, I did want to, at the risk of being a little bit, this is your life here. Well, John's broken up, look. <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to ask you, do you, can you, looking back now, can you see markers in the road where things changed or stepped up in terms of uh, work and jobs for you? Not just, in, not just at the very beginning. Well, look, there's, definitely, there's definitely not a route to being a licensed designer. Everyone always asks that, and especially in the UK, I don't know what it is. In America, 
in America, I always say to my American uh, students that, because uh, I talk at all the different universities over there, and they all get trained. They get an amazing training in how to be an assistant associate. They come out with the most extraordinary vector work skills. I, I don't understand the stuff they do on vector works these days. I use it very basically like I used to back in the 90s. And um, but they're, they're amazing. They come out, but the problem is, is that of sort they're being trained to be. They're being trained to be an assistant associate, not necessarily a lighting designer. And the other problem is in America, they don't have healthcare. Mm. So they don't take that job on the fringe that doesn't pay or pays 150 quid for you to light it because they're not getting their union healthcare. And yeah. so if they get knocked down on the street through no fault of their own or the train crashes or whatever it is, they have to pay and they pay a fortune. I got knocked on my bike. I broke that tiny bone there, a metacarpal in that finger. That was £2,000 in the ambulance. Uh, sorry, $2,000 in the ambulance. Um, $500 to go see a doctor who spent two minutes looking at the x-ray saying, oh yeah, this isn't my speciality, go see this person. I went to walk out of his office saying, thank you very much. He said, no, 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 you have to pay. And then to go and see the specialist and have the operation and all the physio afterwards for a year, you can only imagine the amount of cost of the production. It was over $25,000. Thank God it came from their insurance. So that's why the Americans will always take the job as an assistant and associate on Broadway and not necessarily percolate through as a young lighting designer at the same time because they're not taking those chances. So you need to take the chances on the fringe. You are, oh, to use an awful capitalist analogy, you're a venture capitalist. You are investing in 100 directors on the fringe, like a venture capitalist uh, invests in 100 interesting startup ideas in the hope that one of them makes it and takes you like one did for me, took me all the way from the Battersea Arts Centre in studio, God knows what the hell, all the way to the National Theatre. Yeah. And the investing in that director. And the great thing about that director is he, at every step of the game, dragged me and the set designer up with him. He didn't arrive at the next theatre and allow that artistic director to say, you're very inexperienced. You really are going to have some experience. You need to have some experienced people around you. He always said, no, 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 and brought us up with him. I just encourage the young director you've got to show at the Donmar, who has been told the same, that she needs to fight back about that and take her fantastic, brilliant designer, who I know very well, who'd done all of her work on the fringe. I said, you fight. Uh, your lighting designer isn't available, so capitulate on that one, but say no, this set designer comes with me. Now that set designer is really well thought of in the industry. They were more than capable. They just hadn't had the opportunity to show, we're so London centric, to show their work to the people who were giving those larger jobs. And mm. this is it. If that director had capitulated at that moment, would still only be doing the circle she was doing. She wouldn't be have a had her show in the West End. So yeah. It's yeah. very important. Um the questions, questions, questions. If anyone has a question, do jump in. Because if not, I'm gonna do When can we go home? When will you shut up? <laughs> Yes, Ian's got a question. Go, fire. Yeah, um, I, um, I did my training um, in 1990, finished my training in 1997. Been out of the game a lot. You're still younger back, than me, but, damn you. I don't know. Um, and back, but back, and um, I didn't go to, I went just went to a college in Edinburgh to do production and te technical theatre. Yep. And you were saying about, like, if you didn't go to, like, uh, Rose Bruford or Mount View and everything like that. Um, because because I didn't go to any of them, we, uh, do you think that it's easier, it's it's harder for me to get um, jobs like an assistant or uh, roles like an assistant or anything like that? Because I don't have the formal kind of degrees or anything like that. Yes, and it's also harder because, and I'm not I'm not excusing any of this, but I am telling you the reality of where the industry is at the moment that it is a very uh, London-centric and college-orientated uh, industry. It's funny, isn't it? If we were in a country as large as America, I'm not sure we would have any problem in the theatre base being 400 miles away from uh, where some practitioners live and are. But it's interesting, in such a small nation, it feels 
um, ill distributed. Um, yes, I think it probably has been and is difficult for you, and I'm sorry about that. But you've and un un understand what you're up against and come up with a plan. Whether that's about uh, the Travis and the Tron, and you know places where your experience is understood better and then you spiral out from there but for all of us we start in a it's a very weird career it starts really tiny somewhere in some some theater somewhere and that can have been anywhere in the country and you start in that and then suddenly you, you're like oh okay now i'm being invited around to this circuit of oh now the circuit's got bigger and then something weird happened in my career because it started to go um it started on uh, fringe theatres, and then that fringe guy, before we'd done anything big anywhere in Britain, we were just doing fringe theatres, suddenly he gets offered the scale of the West End in Argentina, we do two huge shows there, and suddenly we end up going, oh, shit, the career became international and massive. The great thing about those two shows was they were hidden from all my uh, contemporaries and all the press in London, and it took a massive amount of pressure off all of our shoulders, director, designer, and lighting designer, because we sort of came into Argentina gently bullshitting our way through, being given an opportunity at the scale of the West End. I'd already sat next to Mark, so I sort of vaguely understood what and how to prepare myself for that. But yeah, and then we came back from Argentina after the two years of doing shows there, you know, one play closer in a in a in a uh, building with a uh, 65 foot proscenium and the next reopening the national theater which got bombed by the military junta reopening the national theater with mi beja dama my fair lady terrible production um, i came across someone just recently who saw it and i said i did my fair lady and they just the look on their face i was like i know it was early work back off so but um but we came out going oh, okay we can so it's a bit like that Henderson experience. You kind of go, you know what's expected of you. So when you get that opportunity in London, you're less scared of it. And uh, yeah, so. Because yeah, yes. I've, 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 I've asked a couple of um, light, uh, lighting designers um, if I can like shadow them and stuff like that. So I don't know if that could lead on to... That's, that's hey, no matter what, that is a good way of... Um, getting to know people and seeing how different people work. Because everything I've told you, some other asshole lighting designer will completely disagree with, which is the glory of this industry. None of us know how to do it. We're not trained to do it. We've made it up as we go along. We all have different aesthetics. We all have different ways of working. We all, so shadow as many people as you can. Go and see as many people as you can because everything that you just, you know, scribble down thinking, oh, that was useful, is someone else is gonna say is utter nonsense. So. And you should probably say is that a nonsense because you're going to find your own way doing it, all of you, as well. And you can look back and say, I love Gobos, he was a git. <laughs> um, Ellen's got a question, I think, for you. Yes, she Ellen, come on. Hi. So I trained at Lipper in Liverpool. Oh, um, lovely, and yes. A lot, and a lot of my contacts and work is in the northwest and north. Who's so you your tutor? Think, uh, Sophia. Uh, Sophia. She was your assistant. I know she told me she all about you. She worked as my assistant yeah. on the show, yes. She told me all about you. Yes, crazy, crazy <laughs> oh, Greek nuts. assistant. I love her so much, but she's so nuts. <laughs> yours. But, well, uh, that, there's an interest, that's an interesting, come back to your question in just a moment. There's an interesting moment. So she had approached me. She'd sent me an email from Greece saying, I work in Greece. I work in Greek theatre. I really want to be able to come and shadow you in London. She didn't have the means to do it. Mm. And I certainly didn't have the means to employ her or pay hotel flights and all the rest of it. So, but then this opportunity came up where I was doing a, a musical in Leicester for Harvey Weinstein, oops. And he, and it was happening in Leicester. And of course, everyone was getting per diem. Everyone was getting a hotel. And so I remembered her and I thought, well, do you know what? Here's the chance of giving Sophia a chance. Uh, and so I called her up and said, look, I need an answer within two hours. <laughs> I didn't give her any time at all. But I said, but, can you come to London? Uh, sorry, can you can you do your own flights? EasyJet's quite cheap, but basically in three weeks' time, come, and then the production will pay everything from the airport onwards. 
your wage, your hotel, your per diem, your travel from London. So she paid, I think, seventy pounds for her return flight to Greece, and she ended up coming. She was rather brilliant, but it was it was a really good opportunity. Again, an opportunity to go. Okay, there's the chance of giving this person. Um, and in fact, she now, you know, she's now stayed here and worked, so, which she yeah, always blames on me. Yeah. She's Sorry. great. No, she's fab. <laughs> Also, she's she got a perfect. great, great viewpoint of European theatre that yeah, no one in any UK college. Yeah, yeah. She she wanted that to be our focus and like to not focus just on London, and she really wanted but us to explore it's that. So narrow in what we yeah. think theatre is. We think it is the National Theatre in the West End. What she's great about is making you all go, "Bugger me! Look at look at this amazing stuff happening in Europe." Loads of inspiration over there. Yeah. Ask your question. I'm sorry, I rambled. <laughs> So, because of course, a lot of my contacts are northwest and the north. Yeah. It feels like with my generation of lines on is that you have to break into the London circuit to get big in theatre. Do you think that's ever going to change? Do you think because there's so many great theatres in the north and in the Midlands, like I live in Stafford, and it, and it feels like there's still such a prioritisation of London and that like you have to break into London to become big in this industry. OK, I don't think that is um, exclusive to your generation at all. I don't think that is. But also, go back to what I said, we're a very small country. Yeah. It's a two and a half hour journey. And you need to think about the longevity of your career, which is something I thought about from the very, very moment I started. I always knew that for me, no matter how brilliant the art was, wherever I was doing it, or with whatever scrappy company in whatever amazing found space, that eventually, if I was to want to have a home and a family and an ability to retire. <laughs> I've, got, I've got one of those. I've got a small portion of this that the bank doesn't own. Um, that I was going to need to make the industry pay. And there are 50 West End theatres in the West, you know, 50 West End theatres in London. And those are the opportunities. Those and tours are the opportunities to get paid a royalty. And without a royalty, really, in the subsidised world, especially if you're trying to live in London, which I would encourage you all to try and live as far out of London as possible while still being able to work in London, um, that you need, you can't really build up much savings. It doesn't really pay what the job is worth uh, in any way, especially when the same amount of time is spent on a job at Trafalgar Studio, Studios or the Cottesloe, the National used to be different how it is now, um, as is spent on a show at Drury Lane or the Olivier. And yet, because there are less seats, you get paid less. I do not, as a plumber employed on a job to plumb 20 toilets, get told that only a hundred people will be using those toilets. So I will get a 10th of my fee rather than a thousand people using those toilets. No other industry allows themselves to be undervalued like we do. And there's the problem. So I always knew that I needed to, as well, I needed to make my name in the subsidized world, do lovely art. It's great. And I still love doing that all the time, but I knew that that was also a springboard to getting trusted for tours, commercial shows, West End. So it doesn't necessarily need to be London from that point of view, in order to get paid for when I'm not there. And it's always being hacked at, producers sort of hate it, but there is still, fingers crossed, touch some wood, artistic royalty is still a thing they pay for. It's gone from being David Hersey's era of gross, of box office, before uh, any fees. So these days when people talk about gross, they mean the gross minus 15%. And that 15% takes off credit card booking fees and group discounts. Gross in David's day was, this show has taken a million pounds at the box office this week. You get this percentage of a million pounds. Those deals don't exist anymore. At best, there are a few writers, Tom Stoppard's one. Um, I think Alan Bennett might be the other. 
they're the only writers that can still insist on a gross fee, which is now gross minus 15%. So it's not even the old gross. And uh, that therefore trickles down to the rest of the team. Whatever the writer takes, uh, you all get. So if they manage to get a gross deal, your deal is against gross as well. Very seldom does that happen. The majority of the industry is a percentage point in a royalty pool. Essentially what that means is, that is whatever the producer tells you the profit is that week. It is net. Now that means that if the producer needs to really push advertising that week and spends all the profit after the cost of the show on advertising, you don't get anything. You get your minimum. There's a minimum in the fee, which normally for license, I know somewhere between 100 quid and 250 if you're lucky a week. <laughs> That's the minimum. But th this, so this is what you're look looking at getting. So these deals are not as good as they used to be, but there is still some percentage payment for artistic royalty. So that always, in my mind, was what I needed to do in order to make this industry pay. Uh, and that comes with sacrifices. I'm very lucky I'm from London and my parents still live on the edge of London. That is my privilege. My privilege is that, that this was a city I was already in. Yes, it's hard, isn't it? But also, it's a national industry. It sort of works. You work your early career in the rep theatres, the producing theatres around the country. You're never going to be lucky. In, you know, I spent years and years and years doing uh, Royal Exchange, Plymouth, Leeds, Edinburgh, Glasgow, mm -hmm. all of those, you know, traveling and traveling and traveling, going around to all of those, making your name. But you're right, what it was doing was ending up spiraling into London. Yeah, I don't know what to say. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Um, and yes, there are lots of fantastic theatres out there. But also, I wonder whether at the end of COVID, people might be changing their attitudes on how they employ. I think that's one of the things, well, that's one of the blue sky thinking things that I think will come out of it, that I've already heard Sheffield talking about trying to find local talent, which is odd because in doing that, what they're also doing is they will break the ecosystem for, yeah, it's really hard. It's not far on the train, that's all I'll say. And if you don't <laughs> live there, uh, commercial producers will put you up and even some even some, uh, some of the subsidized uh, producers will as well. And if not, you need to find some mates uh, and clip on their floor and put up with a hardship for a while. Yeah. I don't know, is that really helpful? I don't know, I don't know. I don't no, have, it's, no, it's, don't it's have helpful. Clarity. No, it is helpful, but yeah, I think it's just, it's the way the industry is, isn't it? We can't really change. That this it's just the way the country is really, really small. And so to expect that it is evenly distributed in all industries everywhere is probably unrealistic. I don't know. It would be nice if there were better. I mean, those, those theatres are really well thought of, you know, Home and um, yeah. Manchester Royal Exchange and the Liverpool Empire and the, uh, uh, sorry, and the Playhouse and... Um, yeah, Everyman's my favourite. Everyman, exactly. Oh my God. And my God, you know, the Everyman was a place to bloody be in the 1970s. The people who came out of that acting company in the 70s, you think that Pete Postlethwaite was there at the same time as Bill Nye, at the mm -hmm. same time as Zoe Wanamaker, and they were all there together. That was the place to be. So yes, it would be nice to see a return to that. But in a world where it's also actor driven, and in a world where actors won't take um, jobs for a year, they won't take a repertoire, repertory job because they are desperate to get a television. And for that television, they need to be close to London for all those auditions. It is a, it is probably become, probably became a more London-centric industry. It's not such a bad place. <laughs> um, question from Sam, if you're there, Sam. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Hi. Hi, so I've had a great opportunity working on Harry Potter. My question is, with regarding colour, did you choose colour beforehand or did you make it up as you went along? There are, um, there's a Potter, for those of you who haven't seen it, is pretty much in the um, candlelight to double daylight colour range, most of it. 
It becomes slightly more colorful in the flashbacks. Um, look, over a career, I figured out the colors that I like most that sit along the black body curve. Do you all know what the black body curve is? Take a black metallic object and point a, um, a blowtorch at it and it will start to glow red and then orange and then yellowish and then eventually get to white hot. That is the black body curve essentially. It is the radiant um, light emission from heating an object. It's how that energy is dispersed. And that within the color circuit, you often see represented as a straight line going from sort of deep blue, kind of dusky blue, all the way through the center and out the other side towards the oranges. And there are certain colors that lie on that black body curve. And that black body curve is something that we as human beings recognize as being natural. It is that light coming through the window behind me. It is this light from my um, tungsten lamp, because I love tungsten, uh, on my skin here at the other end of the spectrum. And that, because those are natural colors that we see during our everyday life, things, especially skin, look very natural underneath them. Anyway, over the years, I've honed my color choices to exactly which ones those are. And um, I like how they combine and I know how they combine together very well. So if I'm doing an naturalistic play, I am not spending hours looking at my bloody swatch books. In fact, I have to say that was probably the first time those swatch books have been out of that drawer in 10 years. But um, I am using uh, all that past knowledge to know which colors I'm using. For the colorful bits, for musicals, I am looking at my, my, my swatch books more to decide what they are. So in Potter, I knew mostly what they were gonna be. The director wanted the, um, wanted the flashback scenes to be monochromatic. And I said, no, 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 that's, that's not going to be enough of a change from what we do the rest of the time. So the, that will have to be the one moment where we're going to kind of full color. I said, I can see what you're seeing. I can see what you're, and this is a problem you're all gonna come across is because people are gonna watch things like Roadkill from last night. And they are going to look at that um, depth of seeming color and yet visibility of skin tone and expect that that's possible in real life and it's not. A lot of that is only possible on film with a colorist. And uh, the contrast you scenes probably are, but you know, what you end up with instead is what I've got, what I had on uh, uh, the treatment that I showed you, you know, really unnatural hues on the face. And if you watched uh, Red Kill, what you'll see is there might be, it might appear that the fluorescent is deep green and this bat light on them is deep green, but what's on their face feels like 201. It feels like something we naturally see skin underneath which is where those black body curve colors are, are really useful. So yeah, essentially um, years of experience. Is that really boring? Yes, sorry. No, that's great, thanks. <laughs> Ethan, Ethan. Hi, um, so I was kind of wondering, you've talked a lot about multi-working, like working on lots of shows in a short period of time, and presumably there was quite a lot of overlap between them. And I was wondering about sort of your approach to managing that. Do you go like, oh, today is this show's day, so I'm working on this, so you're a bit like, oh, I'll do a little bit of that and a little bit of that. Are you, like, how do you approach, say you've got, you know, in that year that you were saying that you did 20 productions, how do you, how do you approach that when you've got like five or six productions all in your head and are trying to figure out exactly where everything goes? I mean, yes, in, in, uh, I, I think the answer is um, in the most scrappy and unorganized way possible. Uh, so I'll be in a theatre teching one show and I will see that there is an impending deadline coming up for the plan of another one. So I will make sure that I've read the script and um, I will be spending uh, lunch hours and dinner hours uh, trying to get some of that work done in the theatre, I will be spending Sunday, much to the annoyance of a partner, uh, if there is one, or much to the annoyance of my mental health, if there isn't one, uh, drawing on a Sunday ready for, to try and catch up on all those deadlines. And what inevitably happens is I don't work well unless there is a, a deadline looming. I have to say the, the amount of work I've got done during lockdown has been minimal because I just sort of gently, you know, watch Cash in the Attic and have a snooze instead. Um, but it takes a, um, yeah, it takes a, it takes a, uh, a deadline and I will sometimes pull a, still, just like when I was at school writing essays, pull an all-nighter till God knows what hour of the morning and feel very tired the next day um, in order to get it finished. And that's the plan drawn. But, you know, in terms of meetings, I have a fold-up bike so that as the tech session finishes at 12.30 or 1, 
I jump on the bike and I cycle the three miles over the river to where the rehearsal room is to go and attend the production meeting to then leave the production meeting after 20 minutes and cycle back and jump straight back onto the um, uh, straight back behind the production desk to start lighting again. It's like that. It is juggling many shows at once. They're all in your head and you're desperately trying to fulfill the deadlines. But the essential in planning them is I say I have to be available from the last few days of rehearsal at, this is at worst, I'll, I'll, uh, through till press night. That's really the essential period of a lighting designer's input. I've done a few days, hours, over many different days of meetings with director and designer, first of all, having read the script, white card model, second white card model, colored model, next model, couple of meetings, production meetings at rehearsal room. If I'm really lucky, I might have turned up for first day of rehearsals, but in general, I'm in tech for another show, so I'm not there at first day of rehearsals. But I will make sure at some point, there'll be a morning where I'm in previews and it could be my first morning off, but instead of having a snooze, which is what I really want to do. I'm at rehearsals, which might only be week two or week three of the next show, but I'm just checking that my ideas are compatible with what's going on in the rehearsal room. And it might be, I watch a very boring morning, morning rehearsals where they just do one scene, but at least in that one scene, I see how they're starting to use the space and I get to just, you know, cogitate some thoughts. But then yes, by the time the press nights happened, press night generally for whatever reason is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So long as I can get to a run through on Friday, Saturday, I could be teching the next show on, on the following week, focusing and teching the next show the following week. So at its tightest in that year of 24, that's exactly what I was doing. I would open a show on the Wednesday or Thursday, travel to next theater, watch a rehearsal, focus it on the Sunday, Monday, tech Tuesday, Wednesday, preview Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, open Wednesday move on. One of the buggers of, of modern theatre is they're doing longer preview periods, but they're paying the same. Another way that we allow ourselves to be screwed, two and a half weeks of preview pays the same as four previews used to. So now if you do a show at the Delmar, you might open it on the Thursday or Friday night, but you don't open the following, when, uh, you might start previewing Thursday or Friday night, but you don't open the following Wednesday like you used to. You open a week and a half on Wednesday away. That's less easy. And if I am going to, on the very rare occasion, like last year, I did five shows back to back in the West End. Uh, and the last two or three previews of a couple of them, I couldn't make. So for that, I employed an associate that I employed to be with me the entire time. So they saw all the plotting period. They're a very experienced person who likes their own shows as well. Really brilliant young lighting designer. Um, but that meant that the director and everyone else had already seen them around. I was making sure they were in on the conversation. So they were always included as part of the conversation about lighting was to me and to them. I'm hugging them here virtually, which is a bit weird, but I wasn't really. Um, and uh, then when I'm not there, actually the shows were finished. But there is that person in case there's a last minute emergency in the day. But let me tell you really clearly, and this is why the industry needs to start paying for it. That cost me half my fees. So I did the same amount of work as I normally would have done, but I got paid half the amount because I had to pay them. I paid them 50% of my fee. In fact, they, they wanted more. And I said, look, I've given you 50%. I think anything more than that is, is um, really unfair. <laughs> and I will give you as many days off as I can during that. So if you don't need to come in in the morning, so you can go on to go off and do other stuff, do it. But let's, let's work together on that. So there. Oh my God, who else wants to... Uh, I, I want to wee about at some point, but anyway, uh, uh, I want a toilet break, but I'm willing to answer more questions if there are any. If there are anybody? No, everyone's bored. Look, they've actually, so, some people are so still that I think you've actually just sort of done a screen grab, like in uh, <laughs> what film that is. <laughs> um, I'll ask you five quick fire questions then to round us up. Oof, and, okay. And then we'll call it a day at that. Um, I promise there'll be quick fire answers though, you know me. Uh, I, I, you, you'll try. Um, if you if you were a supermarket, which one would you be? I'm not answering that question. You'll judge me. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, on the rare occasion that you've got a free Sunday, what would your ideal oh, activity be? Ideally, I'd be walking on Dartmoor or canoeing down a river. 
Brilliant. Someone who continues to inspire you? Many people. James Terrell, Greg Crudson. Yeah. Brilliant. People from other worlds, artists. Yeah. That, that inspires me. Um, Light artists, especially. Yeah. A dinner party guest or guests that you would oh. Wait, hang on, can we do anyone from any time in history? Anywhere, dead or alive. Fantastic, Shakespeare. Fucking sit here and tell me, you fucking wrote them, didn't you? And by the way, what did you do for, do for those 15 years when you retired before you died? Why did you leave? Did you just get fed up with it like the rest of us and go, fuck this for a game of soldiers, I'm moving to the country? <laughs> I, want, I want Shakespeare, I want to find out. Because I want to prove all those snobby wankers who say that that boy from Stratford couldn't have written those plays. I would want to prove them wrong. And if he comes to dinner and says, oh yeah, no, it wasn't me. I'm going to be really pissed off with him. And I'm <laughs> going to say, I wasted my dinner guest on you, you are. <laughs> um, final question. I just, I have a feeling you're going to hate this. If you had to write an autobiography right now, what would you call it? No, oh, no. <laughs> oh no, I know what my, I know what my autograph biography has been called for a long time. And I'm afraid it's slightly dodgy. I'd call it a shaft in the dark. Ah, brilliant. <laughs> Sorry, I do. I, if I've offended anyone there, I apologise, but come on. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. Um, listen, Neil, that's been like three hours. Thank you so, so much. Oh, no, no problem, no problem. Look, the amount of times in a theatre I have said, in fact, Jamie Harrison, the illusions designer from Harry Potter, has a book of inappropriate things I've said innocently in the course of my job, which range from, if you'll excuse this, leave now if you won't, um, which ranged from, uh, oh, Dan, that's a lovely shaft. Uh, just, I need it a little wider. Uh, you know, th things like that to, um, oh my God, what was there was a dreadful one the other day. <gasps> oh, I was in Australia and within five minutes, there was a text from him in Glasgow because someone on the team had texted him and he texted back going, you didn't just fucking say that, did you? And I can't, I'm afraid I can't actually remember what it is now. I'd have to ask him. Anyway, there's an entire book of things you say. When we talk about lighting, it's always, just a little bit harder, just a little bit. I mean, I came back from Argentina. I had a Spanish girlfriend at the time and she said, have you learned any Spanish? And I said, yes, I've learned más suave, más fuerte. <laughs> Softer, harder. She was like, why the fuck have you learned that? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, 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 it's my job, it's my job. <laughs> so I'm afraid, yes, lighting is a terrible, terrible thing. The words we use for it are um, distinctly dodgy a lot of the time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hence the fact I think I can get away with my autobiography title. Definitely. Which is, is Snigger Worthy. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm just a 12 year old boy at heart. I'm sorry. No, it's perfect. Uh, I'm going to wrap us up there. But thank you so, so much for your time. It's been great. Thank you. Um, Thanks to all of you who haven't been here, but you're going to watch in due course. My God, if you get through that three hours and you got this far, you've um, got more staying power than I have. Brilliant.